as always, I have great ideas. I actually even did a lot of work, but as always, I'm running about 10 hours behind. <laughs> I'm running up and down the place yesterday. So as always, this will be, this will be uh, by design, um, but uh, interactive. A lot of this, I'm really curious as to um, where you guys learned your statistics and your machine learning and all that stuff and how long I have absolutely no idea what backgrounds you have. And I know there's some who have, I know one or two. I looked at the, looked at the sign in with, and I know some, some people have some, and some people probably have more than I have, and some people have less than that. I have and, and, and are at a very early stage. So, and, uh, so this is kind of wacky. Um, we'll do this in two weeks, two stages, which is ridiculous because most people would teach most people would try to cover half the stuff in 10 weeks. So uh, this is going to be a, <laughs> so this is hard. Um, and, and so, but it's, it's, we're going to do this together. Okay. And we, and as always, just interact whenever you want and we'll go in different directions. Um, I will, and we'll figure it out together because uh, and, and there's a lot of new stuff. And, but as I, as I was preparing this, there's a couple of things that I just think that are actually very old and very fundamental um, and that are, people don't seem to fully know. And if you get these, the intuition works out really, really easily. One of them, one of them actually, um, I was just asking my TA and my grad student, uh, Nick, uh, about, I said, hey, why does this work? This reason, I mean, yeah. What's the next reason? And then, and, you go, you know, like, and I explained it, and he goes, "Oh yeah, I didn't know that." Uh, so, you know, I'm hoping that we actually pick up some basic intuition. Um, there's uh, along the way, and again, that's going to be done by by us chatting and sort of saying what makes sense to you, as opposed to I don't, I hate I'm. I hate lecturing because <laughs> everything's in a book. Uh, you can read the book, so we might both try to actually go beyond the book and actually talk about stuff that's not clear in the book or whatever it is. The other trick is to actually find the right book. Um, one of the things I did here is that is I actually um, there's a very good book called The Introduction to Statistical Learning, written by four people: Gareth James, Daniela Whitten, Trevor Hasty, and Rob Tipsharan, which is a easy version. Of a much more comprehensive, complicated book. <laughs> Still calls this untold confusion. <laughs> Nobody wants to. Uh, so that, that's a very good, uh, the introduction to, to statistical learning is a very good book. The Elements of Statistical Learning, which is the more comprehensive and complicated book, and also provides a lot of more mathematical detail, uh, but still uh, accessible. Um, we necessarily sort of uh, only cover certain topics, and some of them are kind of old. But I'd say it's they're 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 not what we necessarily teach. And that's the bit. That's what I'm trying to go at. It's not the stuff that you probably have already seen. One of the things I'd like to do today is um, I'd like to know what you what you already know. Three to four we have time, but uh, so we'll do it more interactively, more ad hoc. What you think you know? <laughs> There's a bunch of tech stuff that you actually may think you know, but you don't quite know. Likewise, for me. Okay, what I, I want to know what, what, what you want to know and what level of detail that you want to ask. So we'll talk about this later on at the end. Give me feedback. Uh, let's say I'd like this just to, I'd like to be, basically do this over two weeks with a lot of feedback as opposed to you know, like that wasn't what I wanted. And you don't come back next week. Well, we can do it again. We can do it differently in various different ways. And um, we've been covered different topics, that's the plan, because oh, unless this goes so badly that we need to do it all over again, <laughs> okay? Uh, but sometimes we reinforce some of these, uh, some of the topics we saw today. We can go up and down different technical levels or actually into how you do stuff in software. Yeah? Are your slides available for They should be here. Okay, if you go to the Git repo here, there is a .html file, which if you load that .html file, um, it should be self-contained. It pulls in a bunch of JavaScript, but it's external, so it should all be fine. I'm hoping. If not, mm -hmm. let me know. Okay. I threw, I'm saying all this stuff is here. A few R files in there. There's a few. Um, there's some slides. Okay. If there's any problems with this, let me know. Nope. It's just chat. What's what's going on? Um, well, you can get code online. The HTML. Yeah. Just clone the repository <laughs> or just download the file. You can either just download the file from GitHub or you can clone the repositories just as well. 
or you can you can coerce GitHub to view it for you in some bizarre mode. One of the things, one of the reasons, okay, so we're, we're very we're very flexible. We can talk about case studies. I, I, I've been, I've not done a lot of, I've done very few examples in here for various different reasons, one of which is with my limited time. Uh, we can do a lot more. Um, but one of the things I would actually like for some feedback on is um, we are, have been in the, in, the, in the process of actually creating designated emphasis, which is a PhD level part of the degree, and also what's called a graduate academic certificate. There's reasons why we haven't actually put them in place yet. But, you know, but these aren't technical, these are uh, you know, bureaucratic reasons. But one of the things I think we would like to actually do, and I'd like some feedback on this is, what, what do you want to know in, in what, at the graduate level in terms of machine learning and, and can, would an extended version of what we're going to talk about actually be of, of value? Would it be at the right level? What, what is that level? Okay, because if we have something in a graduate, uh, a designated emphasis or graduate academic certificate in data science, people should know modern, or should know the concept of machine learning, statistical machine learning, um, as well as other things. So it'd be good to actually try to figure out whether or not this, can, whether the, the level of depth is appropriate, the, the level of generality, the theory, whatever it is, is appropriate. So good to have some feedback. Okay, um, again, part of this, one of, I have so many different mo competing motivations behind this. Some of it is when you go get a job, you should actually know something that has happened in the last 20 years, <laughs> as opposed to regression, you know, and that's all I do, and that's why, and, and now there's a reason why we, why, we, why regression dominates, uh, but it's, it's also nice to know some of the concepts and to not be bewildered by some of the, um, the vocabulary, if nothing else, but also then just to, um, to know what some of these methods are, when they're, when they're appropriate, when they're not. There's, uh, if you wander around talking to people in data science, you notice that there's an awful lot of nonsense being talked and people use buzzwords that uh, they don't necessarily understand, but they sound convincing and then everyone nods and, and nonsense goes ahead. Uh, again, a lot of basic elementary uh, concepts and reasoning are really, really important. Um, we're going to focus on classification today. Why? Just because here are some reasons. It's easier to understand. It's more heuristic. Okay. Um, okay. It's not inference, which is helpful. Okay. Some nice general concepts we bring in to track cross validation, all stuff, which most of the people have seen before, I hope, but maybe not. But it's also good to think about. Okay. Um, part of the problem, one of the things you also do is I, it's not necessarily taught, certainly at the undergraduate level, and I'm not sure where you, what classes you've taken. We don't teach as much classification and certainly non parametric classification. Um, and we do ANOVA, ANOVA, and a little bit more ANOVA in every class, and then a few more variations of ANOVA. Um, okay. So, um, I'd say it's slightly more complicated because, and, and it's also a very different concept than some of the, some of the things we're going to talk about. Again, unfortunately, when we have these, uh, I, I'm just pondering the difference between a workshop and a class. And with a workshop, you have no idea who's coming. No idea their background, no idea their interests, and you and we try to adapt. The classes we actually sort of tell, tell you what you need to know, <laughs> and it's our choice. Okay, so this is this is why it's slightly um, chaotic. Um, so, this is, so this is why I like the two week workshops, which is we you, we can get you can give me a lot of feedback if you're willing. And machine learning, lots of nonsense. Okay, okay. They are very important, and what we teach in statistics and what we teach in machine learning degrees and all that sort of stuff is all about methods. If you take a look at the syllabi for any of these classes, it's this method followed by that method, followed by this method, followed by that method. I rarely, if ever, see a class that actually says, here we're going to do data analysis. Data analysis is a totally different concept. Okay, they're related, but one is actually trying to answer questions without concern about what method we're actually going to use. And that's the goal of what we're trying to do in science, is actually answer the question. Uh, many of us in, statistics, in the statistics world, um, the academic statistics, we're very interested in the methods. And then hence we tend to dominate, they tend to dominate the syllabi. And we don't tend to teach the actual um, the data analytic um, component, the practice of data analysis. But I mean, we do teach it a little bit, but we don't emphasize it enough. And a big part of it is, if you get the question wrong, there's no point in doing machine learning. Okay, you can. You can entertain yourself, it's fun. Okay, but it's not answering the right question. 
So framing the question incorrectly basically says we're kind of out to lunch to start with. Okay, these are the kind of just these are just my usual caveats of it. Let's not get sucked into the AI machine learning world uh, uh, hype. Okay, if you're measuring the wrong thing, then anything you're making claims about is not quite necessarily correct. You might be lucky; it might be a good proxy, but you better understand it. Okay, I just had somebody a group a group in my in my capstone class in my project based class they were sort of getting salary or jobs and then point out that these were estimates by the by by the search engine. <laughs> so these are not actual these are not actually the, the salaries. So if your data are not what you think they are and anything you're doing now is not is not correct. Framing questions if you if you don't understand what your stakeholders want, what they're actually interested in, what the cost of misclassification is and what the and and, and how you might misclassify something and, and who it affects. Then, then this is this is the wrong question. The costs are the costs is a very simple thing. Getting the loss function right is extraordinarily important. That's the hardest part of actually doing real machine learning, which is that we frame the question, you define a loss function, what you mean by the error and, and, and how you measure that error. Then we optimize to minimize that loss the loss function, and we're done. In many in many cases, it might be tweak tweaking costs and so forth, costs of being incorrect. Um, Typically, how many of you have ever written down your own loss function? Four. Okay, so the problem is, so we, the loss function comes with a method. Okay, they are, we have a lot of generic methods, but they don't necessarily give us the right, uh, give us the right loss for our question. But hey, it's a lot easier to use a generic method on its own loss function. Okay, so, uh, so there's no doubt that we want to use off the shelf stuff because it's easy, but we also want to think about when it's not appropriate. Okay. If you sample incorrectly, there's no, again, you've kind of got a problem. If you, people, we have a lot of found data. People just get data because it's just there somehow, but it may not have been sampled from an actual population that you're interested in, in which case you, you have got sampling bias, potentially, okay? It's very hard to tell because it, it, this is not something you can measure easily from the sample itself. And by the way, this is something we're gonna talk about bias prediction and estimation bias, but these are not the same thing. One is a sampling bias, which basically says you're looking at a subset of the population, which may not be as general as you want, or maybe even the wrong population. Estimation bias is related to the methods we use, not the sampling. Okay, so there's a whole, we use the term bias, in, and we'll hopefully see it a lot today, um, but it, they're actually slightly different, and we want to sort of keep those in mind, okay? I mean, then you get into some simple things, which is blatantly obvious. If you don't inquire the data, okay, so if you actually sort of only pull every tenth out the row because you, your code is wrong, okay, you only pull Sunday because you, your code is wrong, okay, if you do it systematically or if you, just, or if you do something goofy in your code or, or in your input or by your sampling design, okay, your inference is broken. And then all cleaning of the data and so forth were, is really, really important. None of these have to do with and yet, this is what we always say, that we spend 80% of our time doing this, and that's, that's unfortunate, okay? So, and there's really, if you fail at any point in any of these things, you're basically going to have machine learning for the future, okay? So the methods are important, okay? So we can, we can we'll come back to that in a second, okay? Okay, um, somebody asked me recently, why aren't the methods just easier to use? Why don't we just actually, and they are kind of pretty easy to use, but it's, they're not because you have to figure out which one to use. Okay, you still have a lot of choice. And it would be, what we're, the holy grail is, you know, is the machine that just looks at your data and figures out A, the question, <laughs> B, you know, B, the method, and C, the answer, and then get that right, so it's what you and rough. Okay, that's not how we're gonna, and as I was pointing out, if that happens, Happens, we're all in serious trouble because then none of us are going to have a job. Um, so the so it's it's a, we're, but there are it'd be nice if we could at least frame the question ourselves and then actually that point the machine at the right if it was one universal procedure. But the fact of the matter is there aren't and, there are, and this is the art of machine learning and data analysis is that you actually each method has some assumptions. We tend, as I was reading these books, looking over these books, I was going, God, they don't write their assumptions down the way we used to in math, where you would actually write a theorem down. And as a result, the assumptions are not quite as um, clear. And when we violate the assumptions, we may be doing fine because 
just because you violate the assumptions doesn't mean the method is, isn't actually working correctly, but it, you just don't know. Um, because we literally are theorems that says, if this is true, then this works. If it's not true, we don't know. We didn't write that theorem. So, uh, but we have all these different methods and you actually need to consider different methods, okay? You need to be well aware of this. This is absolutely inherent in everything. And yeah, I'm not sure everyone sort of really personalizes it. That after you've gone through your best, you, you select a method, you, fit, you select a model, okay? Your model is fitted, your best is for your data set and your data set alone, okay? When you get another data set, if you were lucky enough to get another data set, you might get something quite different. Okay, and you're gonna to have to make decisions about that. Okay. Okay, so my my just again, this is all totally superfluous and elementary, it's not just uh, but I it to me it's so important. Uh, if your method, if your best thing depends on your data set, you probably overfit. Okay, so you have to guard against this. And most of you will know what overfitting is, I hope, but we'll talk about it at nauseum. Um, but the fact of the matter is why? Why, not, why are you so wedded to one method? Okay, we'll see another. We'll see a mechanism for actually using more than one method. But the obvious one is at least use multiple methods to actually make, to, just to calibrate the one that you actually are going to use. If you get qualitatively different conclusions, okay, from using different methods, there's something wrong. This ain't science. Okay, there has to be some reproducibility, and the reproducibility should be that it's not entirely dependent on the method that you choose or the tuning parameters that you choose, unless you can justify it. And if you're going to justify that, you actually have to come back with a different data set or some, some independent validation. Okay, so reproducibility if that's the case, but that means, but that means a new data set, or we can come up with other ways. But one of the most important things, and this again is obvious, I hope, is that if you actually, if you use two different methods, they should actually either give you the same, qualitatively the same results, and then you're happy, or they give you different results, in which case you got more information. You literally left residuals on the tape, and you've left some component out of one of the models or both of the models that you can now leverage. So you're actually get, you're getting, you're getting a different view of high dimensional data from these two different models, which means you've got more information. So it's either it's either good, they both agree, or no, they don't agree, and then and you, you got more work to do, but you've also got something to gain. Okay, so I, I like to use several methods that compare. <coughs> and, I, and as I was just saying to Elizabeth yesterday, uh, I also, if I can come up at the end with a plot, Okay, the, the, the actual statistical method may be very complicated, but if my qualitative results cannot be displayed in a simple plot of the raw data afterwards, well, first of all, I'm not convincing anybody. Okay, anyone who isn't going to say that it has to have a mathematical degree uh, that understands the statistics. Um, so I need to be able to go back and actually essentially do the exploratory data analysis guided by my model to say this is what we should have seen. Many cases you will actually need the modeling to, to find those rare events or that subtle, subtle feature, but you should still be able to find them, as opposed to just providing coefficients and a p-value, okay? By the way, this, uh, I've been on my mind recently. What if we know what a p-value is, but a 0.05 p-value, what does that mean? When you, reject, when, you, when you reject the null hypothesis of 0.05, Pardon? If, if and only if the, the null is, is actually true, okay? So you're going to make a claim, okay? You're going to make a claim one in 20 times, where if the if, big if, the trouble is we just don't know, one in 20 times you will make a claim that is false. As sign, I, so that's what the p-value is, that's fine. Now I want people to think about it. What does that mean to you? How many claims do you make in your scientific <coughs> career? A lot, probably. I mean, depending on, how, on what you do and all this stuff, you're probably going to make at least, as a, as a data analyst, you're probably going to make 40, 50, 60 claims, what? A day, a month? <laughs> okay. How willing are you to be wrong? Have you ever actually sat down and said, or thought about this with the 0.05 as to? Because we're kind of slaves to this 0.05. We just do what they were told. It's just a, 
an arbitrary threshold, but you, you are literally, if somebody is feeding you bogus conjectures or you're making bogus conjectures, you are looking kind of stupid. One in every 20 times, okay? If you happen to get a bad run, <laughs> or you do it a couple of days in a row, <laughs> okay? Just think about actually what that means. I don't know that many people actually sit down and say, I am actually prepared to be wrong one in 20 times, okay? Um, we tend to be quite deterministic. We tend to be quite perfectionists. So it's a little bit tricky, okay? So, uh, okay, so one of the things is, if you do the EDA on the differences between these two, you'll find some similarities and some differences and that'll, that'll lead you to things. But, and, I'm, and hopefully you've seen this a little bit, if not, uh, 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 I've heard of it, is there is absolutely nothing holding you back from actually using two models. We tend to have one model, and we pick one model and then we go. So we do the AIC, EIC, all these different criteria to actually figure out two different models. But there is nothing, especially nowadays with computers being fast enough, okay, and big enough, just pick two models, three models, 10 models, and let them actually do the prediction um, all simultaneously, and then average the answer. We like averages, don't we? Okay. So, uh, so this is actually this is also good thing. Just take the take the best of both of both or multiple methods. That that is also a very very simple concept that you can just do yourself. Just take out literally an average, just a simple average. Pardon? Weighted with what? The metric using which model is better? Which model is better? Can you do that? The loss function. The loss function. Confidence. confidence, my confidence, or <laughs> my confidence, I'm kind of both. Yeah, it's kind of common. If you wait with the standard error, okay, you have a prediction, okay, if you're doing regression, you have a, you have a prediction to say, this is my answer, plus or minus this, and this one is, here's a different answer, plus or minus this. Well, we can use weighted averages. We use weighted averages all the time. So hopefully, in your introductory stat class, you saw weighted averages. Hopefully, okay, maybe, maybe not, <laughs> okay. Uh, but we use weighted averages, it's a really good thing, okay, we can actually, we can do better than just combine these averages, we can actually weight them and do something and tell them, why do we weight them? Why do I, why do I weight, we weight this, we weight here, so we have this, uh, so, we, so we have a, a value here, and we have another value here, this is answer two, and this is an answer one. Okay, and we're going to say we're going to just average them together. But we think this is plus or minus this, and we think this is plus or minus this. This gets should get less weight, We're much less confident. Why? Why do we wait? Reduce bias. Pardon? Reduce bias. Reduce bias. X. Reduce bias. That one. That's one potential reason. I don't think it is actually in this case. <laughs> I wanted somebody to say that. <laughs> okay. What's the other reason? So why do we do this? So this is elementary statistics, okay? And yet that's the problem. So there are people that are trying to get CNX convolution neural networks, and yet ask the ask, why do we wait? <laughs> okay, why do we wait? To represent the dispersion? Well, I am going really, I'm gonna get an answer. And it's going to be here. It's going to be closer to this one because this one gets a higher weight. This is the standard deviation, standard error, something, whatever it is. And this one's got a smaller standard deviation. So I want to weight based on confidence or my, or my belief in how accurate this is. This is more accurate according to some bizarre formula that I use that says this is my SD. How do I get this formula? I don't know. Okay? And this one. So we agreed. I got two values, okay? So I measure this, this, so this one here, very simple example, I measure my height, okay? This one, I measure with incredible precision with my very expensive machine. This one, I'm looking, I'm looking down, the, down the room, going, you seem to be about the same height as that black board, or white board over there, and way off, okay? So there's different variables, okay? But I have two estimates. There's no point in actually throwing either one of them away, I might as well combine them. But this one is much more variable. This one is less precise. This one is more precise. So I'm going to average them. I'm going to get an answer. What's it going to, what's it going to do? 
I got you with the answer. You're just going, you think of something complicated. I'm not thinking of it. bias? Will it reduce bias? On average, if I look down there and I'm trying to, and I'm trying to actually figure someone's height from that, I'm probably biased. <laughs> but let's assume that I've actually, that I'm just as likely to be bigger or, or smaller on the true value. So, so these are not biased. These are actually, on average, the correct thing. So then what will we do? Bias variance. Bias variance. I know, but <laughs> it's going to, it is, it, it's related to bias and variance. It's related to the bias, bias variance trade off. In this case, it's going to actually reduce the bias the variance. Okay? Because they're unbiased. I just said I'm claiming these are unbiased. If one of them's biased, that's a, then I got a problem. Okay, then. But I, I'm actually going to actually reduce the variance by, by weight. I just take simple, I just take just like say a simple average, but I just take this and this, add them together and divide by two. This one is how this one potentially has got a bigger error, and my, overall my error is, is wrong. Yeah? Why is the constant of this one all the way out? Oh, that's not okay. And actual value is this isn't the this isn't the, so so if you're if we've got another thing here so so let me just here and here we're not doing hypothesis testing to say are these two things the same this goes back to my earlier slide that says no 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 if these two things are not the same I'm making a big mistake average okay <laughs> this is just a broken question okay this thing and this thing are supposed to measure the same person the same person's height not not one person's height and someone else's height. <laughs> okay, these have to be the same thing. Okay, now if I'm wrong on this, this is again machine learning ain't gonna help me here. I'm just literally sort of taking. So the, what, what, what are some of the good examples? So I basically take somebody's height and then I multiply it by the number of inches of rain, or average the number of inches of rain, and I get something totally different. Uh, they're just measuring totally different things. But these are uh, or measuring something's inches. They have to be, they, they, these are supposed to be replications of the same thing, but with different accuracy. Okay? And the reason we use, we, the reason we weight by the, uh, um, by the accuracy, okay, or one over the lack of precision, or the imprecision, is to reduce the variance. Okay? Because the variance of this sum, x1 plus x2, is, okay, the variance of this plus the variance of this, okay, plus. Plus the covariance of the variance of that value, plus the variance of x2, plus the covariance, and then when we actually put our half in and all that stuff, basically the variance has gone down and we actually wait because, because we're, we're dropping this effect down. Okay, we actually put weights here, which is weight one and weight two. Now this comes out to be weight one, weight two squared, and weight one squared, and if this is getting smaller. It, it shrinks the variance of this component down. If the covariance is here, is that a good thing or a bad thing? By the way, I've gone on a complete tangent and we'll actually come exactly back to where we're going. <laughs> okay? And this is, if we, this is why I was saying, this is, if you understand simple univariate probability and statistics, it actually helps when you get to the well, multivariate. It's almost like the probability. <laughs> okay, what happens here? Give it away, right? What happens here that if they're actually correlated? If, 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 in other words, what we're saying, so everyone with me, that if this weight, so this weight, this one is now SD, which let's just suppose this is twice as big, so this becomes a quarter as big, and this one gets weight of three quarters. Everyone with me? So, that, so this has a higher variance, but now we're weighting it by a, small, by a smaller amount. So the overall variance has gone down from what we just said half and half. Okay, that's that's the point here. If you're not, if I'm moving quickly because I don't want to bore you all to death, but I'm also getting some few blank books and no one actually sort of tell me the right things now. I'm going to, I don't know what to do. Okay, everyone knows what probability is. You can start with the I'm scared. So basically, we're waiting to, and this is the formula. So the, the variance of this of this thing is W1 squared times the variance of x1 plus W2 times the variance of x2 plus the covariance. If this weight is there uh, by, by uh, Decreasing this way, we decrease the variance on the total so the total variance of our estimate. This this is true. We have three or four or five or ten. But what about the covariance? So weighting is a good idea. 
covariance. When will the covariance, when will the overall variance, this, sub, this, this thing, this is the total variance, when will that thing be bigger or smaller? I'm going to assume that we've got the weights right. We can't change the measurement. The, these, these variances are, are fixed. So when will the covariance, when will the variance go up? In this case, everything else is fixed, 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 not fixed. <laughs> so if the covariance goes up, what does that mean? They're correlated because basically I've got two things and basically, if I'm basically saying this one, if this one is above the truth, well, so is this one by, by some bizarre coincidence of our measurement scheme. So then I have less information than two totally independent pieces of information. So this is bad news, okay? So it, uh, my overall variance will go up. What does this overall variance mean, by the way? Just think about what that actually means in the moment. Well, what happens if the covariance, what happens if the covariance or correlation is negative? Hmm? If the correlation of the covariance is negative between x1 and x2, my, my two answers. So when I get, when I'm up, if, if, I, if by chance I am above the truth for this one, I am more likely, I have no idea what's going to happen, but I'm more likely to be below the truth for my set. What's going to happen? You also have less information. No. <laughs> they cancel each other out. I do kind of have less information to some extent, but they cancel each other out. This formula says the covariance is negative. So the overall variance, this is going to take, take something away. So I'm actually doing better. And so I, when I'm basically, and I'm assuming here that these are symmetric and I'm getting to all of them, but again, okay? But basically, if this is above the truth, then this one is likely to be below the truth. That an error here will be offset by an error here, so they will get closer to the overall truth. So negative co correlation between two measurements is actually good. But positive correlation is not bad because we're actually drinking. And we still come back up soon. Okay, everyone with me? So weighting is good, correlated, positively correlated, bad. Okay, uncorrelated, we always go for uncorrelated, but if we were clever, and we go for negatively correlated in certain cases, that can actually be a good thing. Yeah. So the weights don't show up on the covariance? They do. It's one, they, were, they do. Okay. But I'm saying they're fixed, so and I'm, all I'm getting at is they, they do. It's, uh, it's W1 times W2 plus it kind of multiplied all multiplied by two, okay? And the weights are fixed. So if, if covariance goes from positive to negative, or goes from positive to zero to negative, if you look at those three situations, the weights are fixed. So we're, it's either dragging the variance up, not affecting it, or dragging the variance down. Okay, that's all I'm getting at there. Again, quite simple conceptually. What's happening here is that the effect, if, the, if they're positively correlated, the effect of sample size goes down. So basically, if I go along and I'm measuring my, my canonical example, I'm measuring heights of students in Davis, and I say, you know, this is going to be convenient. I happen to be in the gym, and there's the basketball team. There we go, let's go measure their heights. Well, they're pretty much correlated with each other. So I have got much less information than the 11 people I have on the squad. I probably got, it depends on how, how much they're correlated as to how much information I'm actually losing relative to the independent guys. Everyone happy with me? You're not. Um, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around two different models being correlated. Two different models being correlated. Because that's what I said that I said that we have two. I, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible, but but basically I'm saying that we have a, a, a point estimate here. I just literally I literally just have some mechanism for measuring something, and that might mean three or four measurements, and then I average them. But I still only get one number. Okay, and averaging would be good here. So if I'm trying to take some. If I'm trying to take somebody's <coughs> height, and I have an expensive mechanism to do it, I might take it three times. But then if I'm doing the other one, I can do it 15 times. It's cheap and easy, but I can, have, I can, that's built into the variance and I'll average them and all the places. But these are just point estimates. I'm just literally taking two numbers and so saying, what's the average? Well, in the statistical world, it's not just a half. We should actually weight them based on how accurate we think they are. Now, two models. When do we ever get two models that are correlated? So, for example, as I said, you could use this ensemble. You could take 
I could predict, I can do a regression to this, and I can use another regression model altogether, like similar or different. I get two predictions. Now all I'm basically saying, so I'm still gonna get two point estimates. So I, I just get that, I get a prediction error for each. That's my standard error, my standard deviation, so I can glue them together that way. But when, we're, when will models be correlated? Yeah? For example, if they include the main specific knowledge, yeah. then it's inaccurate. So if, they, if they contain domain specific knowledge, they will be, they will be related to each other. Um, so there's correlation now in weird ways, of course, because now the X's will be correlated to your prediction, your actual X's are correlated. But then, but then how are the models correlated? They're also correlated because almost always because we have the same training data. <laughs> so they're glued together, okay? And that's one of the things that I want to get. Like, Okay, so, okay, so, uh, okay, so, it's important, okay, so, um, <coughs> well, let me, I will, I'll, let me just do this quick, okay, again, this is vocabulary for those of you who, uh, uh, this should hopefully be, I never understand, I never remember what people don't know, or what they already do know, so, prediction, we think, we nearly always think of it, we're actually doing continuous prediction of a continuous variable. <coughs> Classification, we're predicting labels or, or group memberships, okay, whether you have a disease or not, it's binary outcome or potentially multi-class outcome. So we're talking about prediction, classification, okay, these are, these, we can, they can, you can quite happily call prediction classification, uh, class, you can call classification prediction if you want, it's not a big deal, it just happens to be a convenient label to say that is actually discrete and not integer values, but actually group membership. Whether they're ordered categorical variables or unordered, it's, it's classification. This is totally, totally different from estimation. Okay, most of people will actually be interested in estimating models where the actual regression case is, is of interest because they want to understand the coefficient because that's the magic scientific piece which says if you increase this variable by one unit, the response changes when you hold everything else constant by that amount. If that's your game, that's great. We tend to be, this, sense, this is why we tend to like regression a lot more and, and parametric models um, because they, they, because there's an actual scientific interpretation. But of course, when we do that, we are actually giving up a whole collection of methods which don't have that capacity. And um, so we may actually want to check when we're being so slaves to this historically for computational reasons, but also for good scientific reasons. When we're in industry, almost no one cares. <laughs> it's like, I just want to know, am I getting the right answer? Because I don't want, I don't care how Google car is figuring out if, I, if there's one more pedestrian walking across the road, how will that change things? I just want to make sure I get the right answer and not kill people. Okay, so um, so we have different models. They have very different goals. And if you don't get the right question, you're in trouble. Okay. Well, prediction doesn't have to be uh, a regression. It can be, but it's uh, but prediction is I, the, 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 the most common distinction. I mean, that, that distinction is is slightly orthogonal. Uh, to the, the predict, this is just the notion that we're actually predicting a continuous variable or, or a, a, a number, so where something actually takes on a number, as opposed to a category. That's the difference between classification theory. We tend to use regression an awful lot. And, but now, what do you mean by regression? Do you mean splines as well? Or do you mean linear regression? Or logistic regression? Well, hang on a second, that's fine. But do you, do you mean linear stuff? Or potentially you mean a classification tree, a, a classification tree for regression? Which is perfectly fine, but that's not that's not a that's not a regression model. But people use that term. Because then you go to coding and the script, then you define a class for it, and you predict. So it's you know the word. Uh, oh, you know, yeah, but that, 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 yeah, but so the, we the, the soft the software tends to use the same word because um, we talked about object oriented programming a couple of weeks ago, which is we want the same generic function, which is predict, but what we are actually classifying in that case. Too much, and in other cases, what we, this this becomes confusing as well, which is we're not. Oftentimes, we are classifying, but in, in, often we will get a score, 
So in logistic regression, for example, we actually get a probability back. We don't we get a log odds of probability back from which we can get the probabilities. And then we actually threshold that to actually get a binary outcome. Okay. And that's that's so the ultimate goal is classification, but we, we get into regression and prediction uh, of something that we don't care about as much. Um, so it's it, that's, it's all slightly confusing, but that piece is just a, a basic not uh, uh, nomenclature, but this estimation is a totally different ballgame where we're actually interested in understanding parameters. And now we have to get our model right, okay? And that's where the bias uh, is important because we actually care about it, whereas in other cases we, don't, we can actually trade off the bias and the variance because we have different characteristics that we're interested in. And then there's supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised, and lots of other different things going on here. Supervised le le uh, learning is when we actually have responses and predictors, so we have a bunch of predictors and we're trying to actually predict a response like your age, like whether you're gonna have a disease, whether you're gonna have a, whether you're gonna have a car accident, whatever it is, whether it's prediction or, uh, or classification. We actually know from our training set the answer, okay? We have a lot of problems where we don't actually have the response. And there's kind of fun stuff that's come out in the last 15 years, which is what happens, and we often have this, where we actually have some very expensively generated or curated um, training data where we have the response, where we actually go and test people for certain things, and we have the predictors, but we also have a whole lot of other stuff which we just kind of found, sometimes not in the same sampling scheme, which is really bad news, okay? But sometimes it's in the same sampling scheme, but we don't, we don't actually do the test. So can we use that? Can you do better? If you, if you have, if I have a thousand observations and I have a hundred responses for them, and 900 that don't have a response, can I use the 900? I like that. Oh, good answer. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, you can. It seems like an awful waste if you just throw away all that information. You can under certain circumstances. Oh, yeah, that can be under certain circumstances again. Okay, so there are, there are methods for actually doing the, for using these again, and they have some nice things that are kind of related to prediction and classification. You can actually essentially classify and predict the response, and then sort of have a feedback loop. Right, that's good. So when we talk about parametric. Um, versus non-parametric. Are, are you all familiar with these terms? There are two concept, concepts I'm going to address them both. One is that you actually know the distribution, the probability distribution of something, and the other one is that you actually know the functional form of the model. Okay? So essentially, where you're actually assuming something is linear or it's quadratic. Or something. That's a, that, that is non-parametric in, in the functional form of the model. This is about the actual distribution of the X's or the residuals or so forth. We have linear models and this, how many of you know about low S smoothing? Yeah. Low S or no W if you want. Low S, local, local smoothing, where we basically say it just, it just assumes no functional form. Okay, where this assumes extraordinarily rigid functional form and it better be right, whereas the other one's much more flexible. So this is two different ways we can actually do parametric and uh, 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 things and they're actually slightly different. Okay, um, this is a quick question. This is 25 different data sets. Are they from the same distribution? How many district? How many different groups do I have in here? More. Tell me. If you, don't, if you don't want to give me an answer, it's a little small one. I can, and, uh, tell, me, um, tell me how you would go about figuring it out. What I'm showing you here is actually density estimates, okay, rather than histograms. Okay, this, I have 25 different samples, and I'm trying to figure out whether or not these are similar. Because basically in statistics, all we do is we, die, we say, we have another characteristic. There's 25 different ways I got this. Are those 25, are there subgroups that are similar? If they are, I'm gonna pull them together because then I get a bigger sample size for that, for that group and I get better estimates by, by combining like with like. If I don't, if they're not the same, like over here, when we said these two things are measuring totally different things, then I don't pull them together. So the first thing I wanna do is figure out, so we split, we, we divide and conquer. We basically split, look based on some criteria, we say, you two, you two guys have the same characteristics, we put you together, you two do not, you five don't, but you are similar, you're not similar to those two, but you are similar to each other, so we'll agree. How many groups do I have here? Um, I just have one, five, one, 
We could do quantile quantiles. Oh yeah, so the first thing, is that this, so this is a density, so we could actually come up with some statistic. I'm giving you all the data. You, you're going to get that. So if you do the quantile quantiles, we still got a problem, which is we still got a 25 quantile plots. So we can actually take a look at them. But these are kind of here, but this is by mode. Okay, this is by mode. Okay, this one goes out. You can't see it. You can, pull, you can you click on this, and uh, if you go to it, and you have to take a closer look. This goes out to seven or eight hundred. This goes out to <coughs> three hundred. Are they the same? So their causes would be different. Are they? You have to make a decision. <laughs> so quantiles, you can come up with some statistics. So quantile, quantile plots are good. You can actually measure the correlation of quantiles, and you can actually look at the distribution of those. Of course, that's collapsing a lot of information now. But do you have any sense as to whether or not these are similar? <coughs> these, are, these are how many groups do you think there are? Just use a statistical test to compare them all pairwise. Ooh, all pairwise? Oh, I'm getting into trouble then. We're going to have to do multiple comparisons. That's all 25. 25, 25 choose two pairs. That's going to be fun, isn't it? <laughs> so, I mean, I can do the quantile quantile plots and I can actually compute the correlation of the quantile plots. I can look at those and I could try to cluster them. If maybe I could look at that and the correlation. Too. The fact of the matter is just what I'm getting at. So, we can do a bunch of testing. Once I start testing, I have multiple comparisons, which is a bit of a fight. You know, do I care? Remember, I asked you about the P being 0.05 and I am going to do 25 choose two. <laughs> you burn through your, your quota of one in 20 <laughs> very, very quickly. I says, you may or may not. What, what you're getting at here, this is a density estimate. And there is variability in the density estimate. These are all from the same distribution. Okay, every single one of these comes from the same distribution. Okay, but there's a lot of variability. Which one, but well, we see the same characteristic. What's happening is down near the end is where the, is, 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 is one of the problems. Okay, so, but, but when you look at these, would you just naturally know that this is okay? We don't, I don't know that we actually have a good sense of what variability is in a density estimate. Okay? Quant that's why we use quantile plots, is because that makes it linear. But still, we still have to know what, how far away we are from linear. But it, it's a little bit tricky. It's a little tricky. There's a lot of variability. With exact, with, this is, I'm lucky here, I've got 25 samples. When was the last time you had 25 independent samples? Never. <laughs> you got one big one. <laughs> okay. But the first thing to do is it's actually kind of nice to be able to actually divide and conquer and actually sort of take a look and see the variability within each group. Okay. Okay. So that's fine. Okay. If you actually there's another plot here, you can't see here, but we put them down. I've actually put the generating distribution. This is simulated data. You can sort of see similarity. Where are we going wrong the most? The tails, the min and the max. Well, the min's not too bad, but the, but the tail is bad, okay? So let's say I'm actually interested in measuring the standard error. Now I want to go back over here and I want to actually compute the maximum. Okay, I'm going to make it easier. The 95th quantile. Again, sorry if, it's, if you've all seen this, this is great, although I will say I didn't, I, I, I didn't get that. All of you may or maybe cross the variance, what happens when the covariance goes up and down, okay? So hopefully there's some value here. How are you going to actually do this? Um, and you can, I'll even let you Google. So this is what we do. We, take, we start with the population, we take a sample. This is univariate x1 to xn. Estimate our population parameter. This is all simple. Okay, hopefully it's like, this is a mean, this is the median, this is standard deviation. Okay, and what we are interested in is computing the sample distribution. That will give us what? What is the sample distribution? Why do we care? Most times we don't. Apparently, we should sweep this under, under the rug very quickly. Suppose I want to see if the actual state is different from zero. What do I do? So I measure something, and it turns out to be 0.0796. Is that different from zero? I pull it. Yeah, no, I will do a t-test. Why will I do a t-test? Because we just jumped two steps. So I'll do a t-test because I'm going to test the null hypothesis that 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 theta in, in in the population is actually zero, and then I will see how far away I am. What do I need for the t-test? Sample size. Sample size. And okay. <laughs> standard error. I need the standard error, and then. Why do I use the t-test? Pardon? 
to compare means. That's what I'm going to do, but why do I use the t-test? Because I could use the non the, the, the Wilcoxon test. Because what distribution is normal? What distribution? I got multiple distributions here. Oh, I got so many distributions floating around here. I'm in trouble. What is the distribution? Distribution of the estimators. Okay, it's the sampling distribution of the estimator. Not of X that I care about. I got X, which is, I don't know. Okay, well, I'm actually interested in the sampling distribution of the estimator. Okay, and what we've done is we made a quick leap to the t test because we said that thing is, because this was done 25, 30 years ago, it's like, uh, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> okay, all we do is we, we can't do the math, it's hard. Okay, so what we would like to do is we we'll use the central limit theorem. Yeah, everyone happy? That's why we teach the central limit theorem. You jump straight to the t test. Okay. What about the 95th quantile? Is that normal? My estimator is now no longer the mean. You've all learned about the, the CLT, potential limit theorem is B. When this is the mean, the mean is. The, the, the distribution of the mean of a sample size n is approximately normal, and as n gets bigger, it gets more normal, and, as, uh, okay, and it's normal with mean true mean and variances. The variance of, my, of the sample mean is. Oh, come on, you all know this one. I know you know <laughs> It's one over what? That's square root. So, so it's one over n. Okay, because that's the standard deviation, one square, square root of n. So it's so, okay. So if the bigger the sample size, the better, but it doesn't go up linearly, that's fine. So we got central limit theorem. Now I'm giving you some time. What about the 95th quantile? I'll make it simple if you watch. What about the maximum? What's the distribution of the maximum? You can Google. <laughs> oh, it's going to be ugly. <laughs> because if you know this functional form, you know the distribution of the individual x's, from what's coming, you can actually do some simple math. Okay? I hope that it turns out to be something you recognize for the maximum seed in the 95th quantile. is a little harder. Okay, to actually do the math. Which one should have the worst? Which one should be harder to estimate? The 95th quantile, the maximum, which is the 100th quantile, or the 75th quantile, the median, which should be harder. The maximum, why? Outliers, we have, because it's going to, because the range is going to, because we're going to average. Because it turns out that actually the central limit theorem will kick in, but badly, but slowly, very slowly. The central limit theorem will kick in for our quantiles because we can set it up as a sum. Of indicator variables, okay? So it's a sum, it's slow. Okay, so how are you gonna, so in real cases, how are you gonna actually get it? Central limit theorem is fine, by the way, it may work quite well. I can't remember if I have a plot here, do I? So here, for example, here's my distribution of x. Anyone know what this distribution is? The black one. It's a fun, it's a fun, probably it's a fun distribution of x. Starts off and goes down a bit. So this this value near zero is actually a little bit more common than any of the ones in here. Okay, but then it goes back up again. This is a beta distribution. This is one of the most magnificent beta distributions. It only goes between zero and one, and you can make it go up. You can make it look like this. You can make it look like a U shape, and you can make it look normal. Okay, but just by changing the parameters. So it's highly flexible, which makes it hard to estimate some of the parts. But basically, you can see again, actually, the color thing. The central limit theorem is here. Okay. We're, we're wrong, okay? The central limit theorem for, for, for a sample size of size 10, okay, is this, and it's not quite accurate. Okay, so how did I get, how did I get this one? This is a more accurate representation. It goes past one, but that's the way I plot it. How did I get it? How, how would you go about doing this? Again, Hoxie's got have to do it with machine learning. We'll get there. <laughs> okay, and again, it's, if you don't, if you don't get univariate, if you don't get, um, if you don't get some of these procedures in the univariate case, it's harder. Much it, it becomes they become very un, unclear in the in your more complicated situations. How did I get that? So these, so this I've actually done. These are more accurate to some, in some, uh, under some circumstances. These are more accurate. This red one here, for example, I would believe more. Okay, because the central limit theorem has not kicked in quite yet. How do I do it? Two methods. 
So one of the ways I can do is I can simulate. I'm so sampling. I can sample again and again and again, but I have to know the real truth. And I don't know the real truth because I don't know where the X's came from. If we go back over to here. I can, I can take more I can simulation on the sample, but I don't know what data is, so I make it up. Okay, I just, just compare it to you. But another way of sampling, another way of simulating, and an obvious way of simulating is to actually just use data to be data hat. Okay, just assume that my population has the same value as my sample for data. Simulate from there, yeah? Okay? And then I see I see the distribution of if I generated a see the sampling distribution, just to make that very, very clear. I got one sample, but I actually I got one data. I need millions of data to actually estimate the sampling distribution if the central limit theorem doesn't apply. The central limit theorem is great because it basically says you you don't you don't need any more samples. You don't need to know anything. We have for a general formula. And anything generic is as accurate as you hate it. Okay? So can we do better? Maybe we can do better. But I'm going to need many, many, I need to figure out. I get one value from one sample. I get another value from another sample. I take a million samples, and I will build up that sampling distribution. But I can't afford to take those samples because they're expensive. Okay? It's going to just take some time. So I'm going to simulate. So I simulate. I don't know what to simulate from because I don't know truth. So I'm going to be simulating not from the real. I'm not going to be replicating the samples from the true population. At least, but I can anchor it wherever I want. But I might as well pick it from here. And if I do that, I sample from what distribution should I sample from? So if I if I happen to know. That I don't know theta, but I do know that these are exponential or gamma or beta. So I, I happen to know in my case these are beta. Okay, I, I'll I'll sample from a beta. Which beta? I'll plug in beta. Okay, my estimate of the two parameters in beta. Okay. So I'll actually anchor my simulation at the sample values, and I will just sample from there. Okay. Now that's not the truth, but it'll be trap. Okay, because I'm actually using the sample values to anchor the sampling distribution. Then I generate n values, compute my statistic, put it on my plot, do it again, 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 everyone with me? That's the bootstrap. What type of bootstrap is that? It's a parametric bootstrap because I'm assuming I understand the, that I know the functional form of the distribution of the x's. Okay, bingo, we're done. Okay, what if I don't know the function? What if I'm not prepared to assume the functional form? Two other techniques. I have two other techniques I could use. Non-parametric bootstrap or, so what's the non-parametric bootstrap? So what I do is I say, I know nothing about x1 to xn. Okay, I'm not assuming any functional form, so this is non-parametric. I do not know. This Two types of parametric. One is the linear model versus non, you know, where we assume the functional form of the model. Or here, it's the distribution, the, which distribution we're sampling from. We don't, if we don't know this, well, there's two ways I can do it. One of them is I just, this is weird, I just sample the x's from my sample again. Okay? okay that seems, anyway, does anyone find that odd? <laughs> <laughs> that, that we're kind of making stuff up? <laughs> It does. It seems weird. Well, of course, if, I, if you do what I said, uh, you won't get very far. You will find out that your estimator has zero variance. And you'll be very happy because you love minimum variance. And that's because I said you resample, you resample the x's, but I didn't say with replacement. You have to do it with replacement, or else you just get back the same sample. Okay, and that's going to be pretty dull. Okay, so we sample with replacement. So this one comes out, we say, we pick a number between one and this guy comes out. Okay, then we put it back in again, we pick another number. Oh, lo and behold, that one comes back up again. On average, 63% of the, of the unique values will actually be in each bootstrap sample. Okay, so 37% will actually be left out. Okay, uh, so that's fine. So we actually, we're gonna get some mixes, mixing up. There's another technique we could actually use, which is to actually estimate the density. Remember those density curves I had? You could actually estimate that and sample a sample in proportion to that. Okay, and you might, and that will fill things in. That's the semi-parametric bootstrap in this particular case. But this will actually give us, uh, the parametric bootstrap, um, okay, will, um, will um, give us, oh boy, 
Um, but basically, the um, the uh, the the bootstrap, whether it be parametric or non-parametric, will actually give us the sampling distribution, which is actually what we care most about. Okay, so what do we do? We ignore the dollar sign. I'm still not fighting with uh, JavaScript and MathJet to actually be consistent on this. Okay, so basically, we, just, we have to do it through our parametric or non-parametric. We compute our statistic. Okay, and um, and we, and we end up with. Um, we end up with our sampling distribution, okay? So the bootstrap is really, really handy. What is it? It is basically making data out of our sample in a very, very, very important way, okay? And if this does not apply, you are seriously misleading yourself, okay? The relationship between the population and my original sample has to be mimicked almost pretty much identically when I take my second sample, when I take my bootstrap samples. Okay, I'm going to end up, I'm going to have one sample. I'm going to, I start off with one sample. Okay, so I start off with one sample, which is what we get. So here's my population. I get one sample, which is x1 up to xn, and then I'm going to go up and do the following. I'm going to actually generate a whole bunch of other samples. Okay, we call these x stars. X star. Each of these ha is, has n observations. Okay, and we, we do this whether we use parametric bootstrap, non-parametric, semi-parametric bootstrap. I don't care. The same method. From each of these, I am going to get a, a statistic t star of x star. Okay, t star of x star. I will build up a distribution from these. I just repeat this ad nauseum until I'm tired. Okay, and I will end up with a a distribution that looks like this. This is the distribution of t of x. And from that, I can actually see things like, okay, so maybe this is my mean. This might be the mean of t of x. And this might be beta hat from my sample. What's that telling me? Lower. Hmm? You're below the mean. You're Which means? Which means that it says that, okay, which basically says that it seems like my estimator is biased. It means that I'm consistently off by a little bit. Okay, so this is going to estimate the bias in my estimator, not my sampling scheme or anything like that, but in my, in my, in my estimator. So what we're basically going to sort of say is, well, that means we actually think theta hat here is actually off from here. Okay, and I know how far off it is. I can adjust the bias. I can actually move it back. Okay, so I can actually I can do this, and if I have two if I have two uh, variables here, so I'm estimating the median and the quantum and the negative quantum, I can actually I'll end up with I'll end up with not just a well, I end up with two histograms, okay, for the 95th quantum percentile, but I'm also going to end up with a distribution a joint distribution, and I can see how they're correlated. Okay, so this is going to be this is giving me a lot more information here. Okay, but this is the bootstrap that I get. But what I'm basically saying, what we're assuming is that the relationship between here and here, so if this is biased, this will be biased down here too. Or more to the point, if this is biased, then this is biased. Okay, and what we need is that the sampling scheme here, from going from here to here, to our bootstrap samples, re reflects the same sampling scheme from here to here. When we're in a nice simple world where we, can, where we have independent, identically distributed observations like x1 to xn, okay, life is great. But when they're in groups, when they're nested, okay, when they're stratified or clustered sampling, these are a problem. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've actually got problems where we have to, we can't just treat each observation as if, it's, as if they're all the same. So if I'm actually, if I'm correlated in time, how do I deal with this? They are, there's actually a real problem with how we sample bootstrap. The, same, the bootstrap applies, but we have to be very careful about the different sampling. Okay, so bootstrapping is great. It gets us past the central limit theorem. By the way, the central limit theorem works pretty well. Okay, so it's not too bad. It's the cases when you when you know it's violated, that's when you actually have to go off. Everybody happy? We'll come back to the bootstrap. There's a reason why we why we bring it up here. Okay, so um, so classification. What are we doing? Okay, like here's the basic setup just to get our nomenclature right. Okay, we're classifying one of G, of G classes. Okay, I'm not going to use K like one does because 
second I was writing these, my very next slide had K for a totally different purpose. <laughs> okay, so G is the number of classes. Okay, so this is basically you're sort of saying what major are you in, what graduate group are you in? Okay, are you male, female? Are you okay? Whatever it is, are you disease, not disease? We've got a X1 to XP predictors. Uh, suppose we didn't have X1 to XP predictors. What would your best bet be? I'm tell so suppose I tell you the proportion in, in, in each class. Suppose I, have a, suppose I know these, which is this is in the population. I say there's 20% are in this group, 20% in that group, and the rest are in a third group. G is three. Okay. Suppose I tell you these, or suppose I give you a sample, and I don't give you any covariance, I give you no predictors, but I tell you that 25% are in one group, okay, 18% are in another group, and the rest are in the third group. What would your best what would your predictor be? It's just I go with the biggest one. <laughs> okay, I know nothing about you, so you're going straight to the biggest group. Yeah, everyone happy? Makes sense, doesn't it? So you just pick the pick the biggest one because I know absolutely nothing. I'm just, I, you're not telling me anything about it, uh, about how these people are related. But if you give me predictors that uh, says everyone everyone who has the blood pressure of this, okay, well that tends to be correlated. That tends to tend to group. So if we start looking at plots, if we start looking at plots like this, we start looking at plots like the following. So here's your blood pressure, and here is here these people are. These people are fine. X means you're fine. X means you're fine. And zero circle means you've got. You're going to have a heart. You have a heart attack, and this is what we're trying to classify. Only two categories here. It's pretty obvious what's going on here. I can predict this without looking. <laughs> okay. Look at this. I, I drop at anything below there. Everyone's fine. Okay. Okay. So we. So this is now. I've, now I've got a perfect predictor. Whereas if I just have something like the following, if I have the following. You know, millions of people here. We've got one percent here. I'm going to, but if I don't tell you about that blood pressure, you're going with I'm going with the million people don't have get don't have a heart attack at this age. Okay, in which case there's only one percent here, one percent here. There's ninety nine percent here. I just use this. I go with, with, if nobody told me any covariance, I use I just go with the, the biggest group. How how often will I be wrong? It's a pretty good a pretty good estimator. Yeah. Pretty good classification, which is I'm only one percent wrong. I would never tell anyone that they're going to have a heart attack, but <laughs> it's just so rare. So we actually have a real problem here. Okay, so we have to measure this. It's not the overall uh, error rate. It's actually what we call specificity and sensitivity. It's how well we do within the different groups. Okay, so. Yeah, you, but that's that, that is a classification problem, which is which goes into a bigger process. Okay, so think about this. So I'll just take this opportunity. So you, if you were to basically say, I believe that no more than five percent of my observations, or I believe exactly five percent of my observations are by you could build that into the mechanism by which it would actually classify those, drop them or downweight them, and then go back, okay, and actually fit the model. So, okay, so what's the model fitting procedure? It's the entire process, okay? And now here's the important part for this. What, what happens when I get a new sample? Which bit do I repeat? I'm gonna repeat the whole thing, which means I will get, I have, I've got two stages of variability. And what I need to do is find out what the overall result, how that changes across sample. The sampling distribution we have here was really simple. Okay, we just basically we have a univariate test statistic, but now I've got a, I've got a fitted model, okay, and I've got it's been done in complicated ways, okay. If you go back to what I when I showed you the twenty five uh, density plots, they were all from the same distribution, which means we were actually looking at the variability of the density plots. If I plot them all on top of each other, you would see they're similar, but there's quite a lot of variability. That is. 
the bias variance trade off that we're going to actually deal with, and it's the variability across fitting the same modeling process to different samples. Okay, what would happen if we did, if we, if we were lucky enough to actually have 100 samples and we did each one separately rather than grouping them together, what would the variability of our process be? And if you bring in extra elements, which is you're going to first of all I classify outliers, then, then fit something else. We have to make sure that the variability is not the variability of our linear model that, that we fit at the end, but it's the variability of the entire fitting process because there's a lot of randomness that will come back in. We will insert, we will misclassify observations and as a result make a bad estimate, a uh, worse estimate on the linear model. So we can't just use the formulas for the linear model because we now have a more complicated fitting uh, process. So we have to actually deal with this. Here's the classification. Here's a very simple one. I'm going to ask you how you're going to do it. These are the pluses. Here are the circles. Blue pluses and, and circle, blue, circle blue, these are purple. We got two variables. How would you actually go about? Um, how would you pick? So we're getting we've got classification. What method would you use to actually classify these? The goal here is to put you get a new one here. Okay, you get a new observation, x1, x2. Okay. You can you get you get x1 and x2. You gotta give me a label. That's the game here. What, what are you gonna do here? So we have k nearest neighbors. Okay, that's one. Okay, so we have k nearest neighbors is one technique we can do. Okay, so there's all these different techniques, and we're going to play with, we're going to try to figure out okay, what, what they actually do. K nearest neighbors. How many of you know? How many of you have not seen k nearest neighbors? Chance to change the book. Okay, so everyone's seen k nearest neighbors. You know? Okay, excellent, good, because it's kind of a fun, fun topic, okay? Okay, K nearest neighbors is one. Okay, we'll get to K nearest neighbors pretty quickly here, okay? Uh, what are we doing here? Let's go back over here. Okay. How would you do this one? Anyone, by the way, anyone, sorry, let's go back to this guy. Anyone want to do this? Anyone got a better way or an alternative way to this? Pardon? SVM with a linear term, okay, SVM, linear term. Anyone else? Yes. Draw a line. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you have to have an SVM. <laughs> draw a line. I like the draw line. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm back to, this is what, it has to make sense. When I was, at, when I was doing my master's up back in Ireland, there was a great professor who said, he said, you know, if it's not common sense at the end, it's probably wrong. <laughs> Statistics, we should be able to come back. And SVM is doing a whole lot. So we do SVM with a linear term and a kernel using all sorts of interesting, oh, I have no idea what you're talking about here. How do I choose C for the SVM? What's C? I have no idea. Okay, draw a line. I like it. <laughs> just draw a line. Okay, because it's clear. We can draw the line here. And we can just put something in here. That's what an SVM is trying to get at, but it's a little bit more general. Now that's fine. Anything else? What else? Something else linear that isn't SVM and that's way more sophisticated because we have to have come up with decision trees. Decision, yeah. decision trees. We can do decision trees, although well, that might be overkill. Yeah, okay, decision trees. Anything else? Somebody else got a hand up, I see. Perception. Uh, Neural network. Perception. Okay, so these are again, I still think draw a line. Yeah. <laughs> for, for, I mean, how many of you know about perceptrons? How many of you know about neural networks? So we're kind of so this is a big part for me is like okay great wow that's really cool support vector machines then you do outlier detection beforehand you you fit it into a support vector machine and then you then you do something else later on I have no idea what you've done I have no idea so I'm going to have to actually figure out whether you get the right answer or not then maybe I have some credit for the galaxy uh, otherwise I you you lost me but if it does, if it does good prediction maybe it's fine anything else there's one other term that there's one other term that you guys all know. This is Bayesian. Bayesian. Oh, yeah, we're gonna have real fun. So there's Bayesian decision boundaries, okay, which is so decision boundary, and I'm gonna actually take away the word Bayesian, I'm gonna actually just say Bayes decision boundary, because that's actually the heart of a huge amount of what we do. It's not a Bayesian technique, it's just literally just 
five days there, we actually know the right thing to do here. We say, you cannot do better than this. Unfortunately, we can't, we don't have to do this, but we can say, if we do certain things, we'd say, you cannot do better than this. One other thing, anything else? You look at the component analysis. <laughs> No, just a compression. Okay, you can look at principal components. We can do all sorts of fun stuff, but that's not going to get us. That's just going to get us X's to put into these different things. We could do that. Okay, but look, these are all the different ones. Okay, so you could actually write down. But drawing the lines is pretty darn good. Okay, K nearest neighbors is good. This is fine. Okay, so these are just I generated these very simply. Okay, the the codes in there. What about this one? Which ones can we start ruling out? <laughs> yeah, can you maybe draw two lines? Which is perfectly fine. So I think like two. <laughs> which I like. Okay, we can draw two lines, of course. You know, and that might and that might just work out just fine. Okay, but it's it's and again, if that's the if that's the problem, go for that. If, but if we need a more if we need need a more parametric and I and neater, uh, more succinct representation, that's great. Will logistic regression do it? Okay, would support vector machines do it? Not with linear. So not with the linear terms, we need a non-linear term. Okay, and you can do this because one of the ways to do it is basically, the canonical example here is just bringing a third variable, which is, which, which brings these up, okay? Which is the distance from the center here. Okay, so we bring these guys up and we bring these guys low and now you can just draw a straight line, a hyperplane straight through it, okay? So if you bring in, if you can feature engineer to actually get more variables that actually separate them, that's great, but now we've got to figure that out. Okay, k nearest neighbors, will that still work or not? Yeah, it will always work. Because <laughs> it, it says, I am, it's non-parametric, it says I have no, Assumptions about any linear boundaries. We've got two linear boundaries. I don't care. Okay, which will do better, K and M or uh, or um, support vector machines, which you may not know about, but it's basically just exploiting the lines here. Pardon? Who said that? You did. Sorry, I was going here, <laughs> but not very, not very vociferous. <laughs> you know, you K K and M. We don't know. In fact, like they should. They should both do just. They should just knock this out of the park. It's completely separable. It was just. This isn't hard. Now, when these start, guy, when these guys, well, for example, okay. So they should all do well when they start getting more realistic. When these over, start overlapping, which will do better? Um, I don't know because there really is a line here. There really are two lines here. So it's we can exploit that information, and that's because there's but. But um, what we're going to actually end up with the line, because we can see the lines the, essentially here, we're right that the lines are there. Therefore, and when we fit the lines, they're not biased. Okay? But the, what, what, what the K nearest neighbors will do is they will increase the variance. Okay? But there will be no bias, because, okay? But hey, there'll be a lot more variance. But hey, there was no bias with the lines. So everything was fine. If there weren't lines here, we fit lines, we're introducing bias. But in that case, we in that case, there's more bias in the lines. The variability is small. K nearest neighbors is less biased, but it may have smaller variability. Okay, so we have to trade these off. What about this one? Purple, blue, purple, blue. <laughs> Still only two classes. You could argue that there really are four groups here, but when we label them, nobody said that. <laughs> so we only have all we have is A, B, A, B. So we can't go back and, and, and sort of say they're, they're different. These are bimodal distributions for the two groups, perfectly different. Now, which one will work? Three lines? SVMs? What term? We went from linear to essentially a quadratic, which means, okay, cubic is coming next. <laughs> okay, can we actually sort of get it so that we can actually draw a hyperplane? So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna actually have to lift these two groups up, okay? And then draw, and leave these two guys down and draw a plane in between them. Or maybe I can do it in four dimensions, okay? And draw a plane that actually separates these guys down. That's gonna be a tough one. 
that's a single plane for these is going to be a tricky, tricky one. So you're going to have to come up with very cleverly select your X's, your, your kernel term, okay? Your, your, how to bring in more dimensions here. Your feature engineering is going to be a little bit tricky. But K nearest neighbors, let's just look at this, okay? Here's a big, big premise. That things that are observations that are close together in the X, the X1, X2, if they're close together in X1, X2, they should be close together in the outcome, the response. That's the assumption. <laughs> okay. It didn't work back here, did it? Hmm? I said it too. <laughs> kind of did, didn't it? But not quite. We kind of like the idea that basically, we kind of like the idea where they're okay, is that things that are close together will be, will be more similar to each other than, than the ones that are further away from. But in fact, there's two groups here because it's bimodal because we set up that. But it kind of did actually work. So it, it's fine. So this assumption is reasonably okay. Okay? So we have this concept of, this, this is a nice English, it's close together, okay? Similar. Okay, the X's are close together, the similar in Y, pretty vague and nebulous here. Okay, I haven't really been that way. Okay, so what do we have? We start with the labels training set. Again, this is supervised learning. We know the Y's for our training, X1 up to XP, okay, for each observation. I'm just going to say K is equal to 3 because I'm God and I can, I can say K is equal to 3. So, what do we, here's, here's what we do. We predict the group of a new observation. Here's our new observation. Test that test there. We say we find the k, the k equals three. We find the three nearest neighbors. Okay, very simple, straightforward. So I'm here. This is my new observation. I find the three nearest neighbors. This one, this one, and this one. Okay, and two of them are pluses. That means by majority vote. Okay, I'm a plus. Okay, and, uh, two out of three. How accurate is that? Less accurate than if all three of them are. Okay, so we also have a slight built-in estimate of some confidence. It's non-parametric, it's just, okay, it's fine. So what could possibly go wrong? What if you use k is equal to one? I, when I do this, on a normal set of things that I take extreme cases. <laughs> okay, now I go like, whoa, which way? This is a weird one because it's related to bias and variance. Okay? And this is again, to me, this is some, I, I, I have professors, some very well known professors teach me statistics and I kind of bias variance and I never really, they never really explained it to me and I'm not probably going to do a good job at it. But, but I, I think it's so important and again, you, you explain, you can think about it some, uh, it explains so much if you actually understand how to reason about it. What happens with k is equal to one? All I'm looking for is just one observation. Okay, so I, I get a point here. It's just this guy. Okay, so I'm right here. Okay, so I'm at plus. What happens if I move to here? <clears throat> I'm now a circle. So what's that, what does that tell me? High variance, okay? So if the, more to the point, if I'm here, I'm, if X is still sitting here, this is my new test, test observation, but if in my sample, this guy needs to be he's now closer. So if I get a different training set, I will eat just by, this is, this is measured. Happy that this guy would move around in a little circle like this, okay? Okay, or maybe in a, in a long uh, ellipse like this, if they're highly correlated, that's fine. But it's quite likely that if, even if everybody else stayed exactly the same, my, my next sample would have that point moved over. It's perfectly reasonable. So this is highly variable. Is it biased? No, because the variance trade-off, <laughs> we're, probably, we're probably giving up some bias. We, we, it, may, it may be biased, we don't know. What about k is equal to n over 2? Half the things. We take half of them. Okay, let's take this, let's take the extreme one again. Just go to the extremes. What happens if k is n? Mm -hmm. Which? Aren't you just picking the Yes. I'm just saying it's going to be the same no matter what my x's are. I'm close to all of you guys. Tell me who wins. <laughs> so it's kind of pretty useless. So that's what. Now, what happens when my data change? What happens when my data change? 
Okay, the portions will change a little bit when you're around. Okay, but the bias here is not, is, okay, this is highly biased. It's not actually adapting to anything. It's just basically saying, I don't care. I don't care what your X's are. I am not interested. This is clearly highly, highly biased. Okay, it's not picking up any model features or any of the predictor features, okay? So very, very, very clearly biased. Okay, so this is the bias variance trade-off, okay? And, then the way, and what we talk about here is that we have a, a, a total mean squared error or classification rate. It's all the same, okay? They, 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 they look different, but it's, they're doing this kind of thing. We just do it this way for simplicity. And it's the difference between if I get a new test observation, how does it differ from my predicted value? And it's pretty obvious, I hope, that this, when you break it down like this, there's just inherent, there's inherent or irreducible measurement error. Okay, but you just can't overcome. This is the noise in the system or the variability uh, in, in the outcomes. But then there is also how much your estimator changes as you change the sample. Okay, go from one sample to the next. These, these vary. Okay? Okay, so we had a density estimator, and then we had another density estimator for the same thing, and they had variability in them. And it's complicated what the variability is, but because it's actually, but it's at a particular x0 that we care about. It's not across all of the x's, it's about this particular x0. But of course, we're interested in aggregating across all the x's. And then there's the difference between, which is the structural difference, which is I am systematically getting something wrong. Okay, this is the bias we had over here. Is my estimator is constantly off. Okay, that's the, that's the inherent bias. Okay, so if I'm if I've got a line, so if I have a line, my estimator if, if this if this is truth, okay, and I have a line, it does pretty well, but it's already biased. Okay, there is an inherent structural bias that I'm missing that I don't know about. But that I can't know about it necessarily because I can never see the green line, but that's that's the um, but that's the, that's the bias. But at a given x zero, we have a bias, and it depends. But this line that we actually fit will also oscillate. It will actually be this line here, it will be this line here, and this line here, and this line here as we change samples. That's the variability that we actually have, and then I can trade those off a little bit. Okay, so what's actually happening in my k nearest neighbors over here? With k is equal to one, we're actually getting a very, very uh, interesting boundary. Going back to these Bayes boundaries, it's incredibly flexible because it's just whenever I whenever I switch as I move across here, whenever I switch to another closer to a different type. Of Point, I would classify differently. So this, this, as these guys get closer and closer, it's able to draw the line like this. No longer a line, it's actually a curve. It's basically saying, as we move through here, I'm going to find the point at which I would just turn, I would switch from classifying you from a plus to a, a zero. Okay? And as, and as these start overlapping, I'm going to get misclassifications, but I still don't have a lot of flexibility. When k is equal to n over 2, I'm going to lose that flexibility. When k is equal to n, I've lost all flexibility. It's just like, there's, there's, I give you back the same answer regardless of your x's. Okay, it's just a single point that I actually, that I will actually give you back. So this is, this is nice. So this is, this is a very good example of the bias variance trade-off. Okay? Okay, because we actually can control, we can control this and, and life is good. We'll come back to this in a second. How do you determine these? In my model for KNN, which is a perfectly fine model, it may not be the best model, or hang on a second, it's not that expensive, it's kind of easy. It, it, it may get us a long way without actually having to do a lot of feature engineering, maybe, maybe nothing else, but uh, there, there, it, it's surprisingly good in many, in, in, in many cases, not necessarily the best, but it's surprisingly good. How do you determine K, the number of neighbors? There's no R squared here. We're going to do this classification, but yeah, so but yeah, we can we can try different Ks and see how well it does. Okay, it's going to be a problem there, isn't there? <laughs> Anyone else? What's the problem? Just find the K that and see how well it does. First way to define how well we do, so minimize R squared. If we're doing prediction, if we're doing classification, we'll do maybe minimize the prediction error. 
So that's, that becomes a metric that we can actually use. Okay, so what's wrong? How well it does on what? On what? Yeah, on what? What are, you, what are we going to test it on? Because if I say k is equal to 1 and I use my own x's, I should be close to me. <laughs> yes, look, I have the same value as me too. Okay, so k, k being equal to one should work very well if we if we if we run our training set through this. Okay, so what's the clearly the obvious problem? We need a new training set. So where do we get that from? And you and you test that just like so. So this is the, the bias variance trade-off was test. So we need a test. We need something that wasn't used to fit the model. The is maybe the most extreme example where you go like, if we go to k is equal to one, I can predict myself perfectly. No one will get in the way. <laughs> okay, I will just ask one person and it'll be a nice simple vote. Okay, we still have to get distance as well. So we can do k and then we can go do distance. Okay, but we can use the same technique. So what's the obvious technique? How can we all come across this? We're going to use cross validation. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to make up our training set. It's kind of the same stupid magic that we get with the bootstrap, which is, no, look at me, I've got lots of, I've got lots of data sets. No, I don't. I had N observations, and now I've just carved them up. Okay, we're going to use cross-validation. It's very straightforward. Okay, it's got two purposes. Estimation of the test MSE, or your misclassification rate, or to actually estimate or to, to find the best value, the optimal value for these use of these parameters. Okay, fine. So these are the two purposes it has. Okay. The good news is when you do one, you get, you get the other for free kind of idea. Because it's K, that's fine. All we're basically going to do, two or more models. By the way, how many models do I have in K nearest neighbors? N, two N, <laughs> K, one model. I got one model, don't I? K nearest neighbors, it's just a model. So it's different from, like over here, I actually have multiple models here. I've got these three different lines. Now I'd be stupid to actually have multiple lines here. I just use the best fit in these squares. But I could actually have different, I could try a different one. Or certainly I could try, I could actually make the same, but I could also try, maybe I will try a quadratic. Maybe I'll try a cube. Okay, I will try all these different models. But even the lines, maybe multiple things. I have different models, but with K, you go back to the way I phrased it was, here's a model, okay? Which was, what was it? It was you basically, one, given a K and a distance, okay? So that's the point. Given a K and a distance, that's a single model. Given a different K, but the same distance, that's a separate model. Given the same K, but a different distance, okay? Go through all possible combinations. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a bunch of, I'm gonna set up a grid of, here's all my, here's all my distances down here, and turn this categorical. Okay, I'm going to use Euclidean, Manhattan, Canberra, all these different things. I'm going to scale before I take the distance, not scale before I take the distance. I don't care. I'm going to try everything, weird stuff. I'm going to map categorical variables, variables into weird numerical values so I can actually compute distances. I'm making all sorts of setup. And what I'm going to basically do is I'm going to make sure I get some independent validation because what we really want is the prediction and classification that we end up with, with on new data that we will actually do best. Okay, on new data. So not because so that we will actually train to ourselves. We will overfit. We will have incredible amounts of bias or variance if we overfit to the training data. Bias? Who said bias? Bias. So I'm overfitting to the data to the training data. Okay, so very, it's, it's not obvious. <laughs> you gotta think about bias variance. Okay. So the problem with bias, so 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 we will overfit to this, the people do the cubic, okay? Which basically, the more flexibility we have, okay? The more overfitting we're doing, okay? We're kind of, not, we're, 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 we're chasing the points. And that means that when the next sample in, one of those points will change, and all of a sudden, our curve, will, our, 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 our cubic, would now actually become this. And whoa, that's a heck of a big change, okay? Just because this point moved down. So that's, Okay, so that's very, very variable prediction we're getting. So variable functional form as well. Okay, whereas the bias it comes from basically so sort of says, hey, that's my line. I'm missing a structural component. Okay, so I never be right. On average, I'm right because I'm a little bit below and a little bit above. But there's bias. I'll never actually pull out this feature. 
Okay, so um, the more flexibility or the greater the degree of freedom or the, the more complicated our model, the, 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 the higher the variability across samples because we're chasing, we're chasing the, the idiosyncratic nature of our own sample. Okay, so basically what are we going to do? We're going to do cross-validation. How do you do cross-validation and why? There's three ways to do cross-validation. Four, but we'll only talk about three. So we're going to split the data into. We take, we take our, we take, we take our data, we take our data, and we do this. Okay. We take our, our training. We take our training data, and we are going to divide it into two. Okay. So, okay. I'm going to just, here, here's going to be my new test set, and here's going to be my training bit. Okay. I can move this up and down. You can say how much is in there. Okay, then I fit, I fit the model. Which model? All of them? Oh, I'm be tired after a while. <laughs> okay, I have different choices. I fit a model, fit one model, all of them, one of them. I, I have a choice here, okay? I can do this, okay? I, either works, not really, but okay? But all of them seems like a sensible idea. Okay, we do this, and then we predict. Okay, then we do some classification or prediction. Classify the test set. Note, we didn't use this test data to actually fit this model, so this is it cannot be chasing itself. Okay, going to k nearest neighbors with k is equal to one. I am no longer in the training data, so I can't be close to something in the training data. I cannot. I cannot ask myself. What label I have. So this is good. We have this is what we want in science, an independent data set, something to externally validate. So we do this. So how do we pick the test set? Randomly. Randomly? Not randomly. So let's assume, let's assume these are let's assume so I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I will say this, okay? I'm going to do regression or I'm going to do classification. Here's X, here's Y. So this is my response, this is X. I will tell you this. I've seen this happen. Do not sample the X's and then sample the Y's. <laughs> Keep them together. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> I mean, people do regression. But it's, I only have seen positive correlation between these. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but they order the x's and order the y's. They sample them independently. They're, you have to sample observational units. In the in the nasty case when they're actually when there's some structure to the sample, we need like the bootstrap to replicate that sampling procedure. Otherwise, we ain't actually capturing the variability that we would actually have if we got a new test data. Okay, so you have to do you have to be careful about this, and it is hard. You have to, it's seriously hard, but. Well, one of the ways to do it is just this. It's just okay. Let's let's pick out. How many? How many should I pick out? Twenty percent? Eighty percent? The more I have in my test data, the better my estimate of the test and is. Isn't that true? Because we're going to be averaging over more things. Sounds good. So we'll take eighty percent. Why not? Why not? This is actually a this matters. Okay. Again, this is the reasoning behind here. Actually, helps a little bit. To understand some things going on. Well, okay, so 20%, we can flip, we can flip around. So okay, I'll do this once. So what's the problem? What's the problem with doing it just once? Or we just pull out a test set. We just split them. They have to be everything that's in here has to be not used in the training. So we just do this. So I do divide it in half, 50% training, 50% test fit, get my compute my test misclassification rate. I do this again for a second model. I might see which one wins. That's that's all, that's all we're doing. We, have, we now have a really good you know, competition here. We're saying, look, I'm going, you can both fit ridiculously stupid, complicated models, but the only way we're going to measure your performance is on data that you haven't seen before. A perfectly good fight. We do this. So I come up with my cubic model here. You come up with your linear model. Somebody else comes up with the actual quadratic model. They will win because it should be closer. It may be that they don't win because of the sample, but that's weird. On average, they will, which means we don't really care. Okay, but we're just going to kind of play the game. Okay, and so say, I'm, I'm just, I hope that will be <laughs> except for the one in 20 chance that you actually have to make the most. 
and false claim, which you do. Okay, so what are we going to do? Go split it in, split it in half. 20%, 80%, anything more intelligent? How about the 37% the booster? 37% the booster. Now I think we're mixing two different concepts. <laughs> that was from sampling of the place. But it leaves that 37%. So? Yeah, that's so? <laughs> so? Maybe that's a magical number. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a magical number. Maybe we should use some, some other irrational number. Maybe we'll use five. What is the 27 to 24 digits of pi. <laughs> and add them all together. <laughs> um, it, I, the, you, there may be something that's connected to the magical 37 bootstrap. I don't know what it is, and if you think about it, it's, uh, I like creative thinking about like, what is the logic here. Well, there's different ways to do it. One of them is just to split it in half. The trouble with splitting it in half is what? I'm doing this on just having tra one training set, one test set. What's the problem with that? You don't have the same set of Maybe. I got 50 Depends how big it is, but I got, I suppose, I mean, that's the trouble. It's, what's that? What, well, there's two problems. One is, if, if, I, if I do 80% here, and I got 20% here, let's take this to the extreme, I get 1% here, it's like, hang on a second, the model sucks, okay? The actual parameter estimates are nonsense. Now we've got huge variability in our fitting. Okay, this is gonna be highly variable, so it's, it's not a fair game. So I can squeeze this back up again. But, so suppose I get enough to actually fit this reasonably well, and I, and I need to leave a lot of the test up. I mean, I could take it to the other extreme, which is I need one observation out here, and I fit on the 1994. That's perfectly reasonable. Okay, but now I'm putting, but think about that. What's, what's the problem there? Goes back to what we were talking about even before the weight, weight averages. What's the problem? You can say that they are there. It's very simple. This is statistics is simple. <laughs> It is, it really is, if you just take it, <laughs> if you do the common sense. What's the problem with only having one observation here to, to test my MSC? I basically get two, I, I, I predict, the, I got two models and I predict this one observation. And whoever wins, wins. Mm -hmm. It would have been some other observation, the outcome would be very good. So highly, highly, highly variable estimates in my test MSC. So I need to have three observations. That's, I love averaging, I love to average, okay? That's, what, that's the whole point of statistics is averaging. My thesis advisor said, said all we do is add and divide in statistics, and it's true. Okay, it's just we have, to, we have to add the right things together and divide by the right number. Okay, and again, I'm just slicing and dicing. So we, we want more of this. There's a trade off here. There's a bias variance trade off of how well we estimate this thing, how stable it is, and how, how well we estimate this. So, what's a better trade? Do you have to cross validate on the test sentence? <laughs> oh, I like that. I never heard that one. I like it though. Cross valley and test. I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> but boy, I can see the lights in the computer. <laughs> we can do that. So, so, there's, so there's, one of, there's, two, there's two approaches. But one thing we want, so the real trick is what we actually want here is that every observation actually goes, gets a shot at being predicted. Because otherwise, it is possible, as, and I've seen that. So, as well as much as people sample the X's and then sample the Y's, I've seen wonderful things that go basically. What I'll do is I'll I'll take the first ten percent of my sample, which is January, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll fit on the rest because my data are sorted. <laughs> okay, not good news. Okay, so uh, so that's so we, we want we want to actually end up with a good sample. So that our test set is representative. But the other trick we want is ideally we would like to give the firmer trick is where the cross validation comes in, which is we'll we'll actually have each observation in in our overall training set we will put into a test set once and once only. We get one shot, okay? And the rest of the time it will be in the training set, okay? So we're gonna block this into blocks, okay? Okay, and so we'll break. this is one test set. The remainder is the is the uh, is the training set. We fit the models on the training set that we predict. Okay, then we put this guy back in again, and then we take this guy out of our test set, and we collapse him down. Fit on the resulting training set. Go back, and now we're averaging over a good, good set of things. Okay, we now every, now everything's good. Yeah. Always you have to have a test that your mother has been yeah. told. So they say like you have this, so you do cross-validation training. I mean, you do all this like 
living out, living in all these things, I'm telling you, but never I'm interested. And then when you decide on your model, then you will test it. Sure. Ideally, we have, so in the slides, I'm just glossing over this briefly. In the slides, ideally, and I'm, so how many of you have ever had the luxury of being able to say, you know what, I've got N observations. Before I do anything, I'm just going to put some of them away. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I promise I will not look at them. Okay. And then what I'm going to do with the remainder, I'm going to put some of them aside for my validation. Okay, and then I'm going to fit on the one observation I have left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're all very greedy. That's what we should be doing. We should actually be set. We should have our data, our sample should be divided into three groups. Our training set, our validation set, okay, for cross validation for this sort of thing. And then, okay, fine, I finally nailed the model. Now let me go off and actually get the, the error. I estimate the error. Well, that's nice. I love it. I love the, I like the idea. Just, I, 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 I have people walk in here and sort of say, you know, what can I do with these five observations? It's like, <laughs> I don't know, but I'll tell you one thing, we're not going to split them up into three different test sets. <laughs> okay? So, um, so yeah, ideally we'd like to do this, but this is a mechanism around this, okay? So we, we, we take these blocks, how big should a block be? <laughs> how big should a block be? There's one approach, which is the block should be, each one should have size one. You take one, this is called lead one out cross validation. You take one guy out, thin on the rest. And that's got a, that's a, a very sensible reason for that. And another approach is that, that another approach is just have one observation in the training set and leave everybody in the test set. That doesn't work if you have a single line. Okay, so we're never, nobody's ever going to do that. Okay, so the other approach is that we actually divide into blocks like we divide into five different blocks or ten different blocks. So we have this concept of k-fold or leave one out cross validation. Okay, everyone with me on what this is? Leave one out just says we're going to have n training sets and n test sets. Each test set has size one. Each training set has size n minus one. Every observation will be in one training set. Uh, it will be one test set, and and Every observation will be in 99 n minus one training uh, sets. The other approach is k fold. Let's say let's say it's ten fold. Ten percent is taken out. You fit the back. Okay, so every training set, every observation will be in exactly one test set, and it will be in nine of the other ones. We did ten, uh, ten fold, which is better. <laughs> you, you, you're forgiven because you have to go off on TA, so we've discussed this before. It's the same problem we had earlier on. Right on that force. Hmm? It's the bias, that's over here. I was pointing here. Okay, so which is better? We're trying to test the mean squared error. Well, the problem, the good thing about, the good thing with leave one out, how many observations am I using in my training set? N minus one. So this is very close to N, which means that my all my estimates will be very close. But as we said, if we go down to 10%, well, hang on a second, my model fitting is entirely different than if I was using 90%. So the variability of my actual model fit is, is huge, okay? Okay, well, that's kind of bad. So, we're, so this is not a good representation. So it's actually biased. Sorry, 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 sorry. N minus one is actually looking very close to what we actually want. The trouble with k-fold is I had 100 observations, let's say, and now I'm doing 10 full cross validation. I've only got 90 in my training set, which is different from 100. And if that makes a difference in terms of the model, I think, well, so if it's actually estimating something slightly different, my standard error, for example, in progression is actually now going to be less accurate. Okay, it's biased. Okay, Dan, we're actually estimating something different. So we should we use leave one out cross validation. <coughs> yes. Does, does it depend on the size of your data set? It does. I mean, to some extent, but the general concept that we're talking about here is fine. Like, again, we, if we we don't know the truth, but the issue is that basically I'm estimating something slightly different. I'm estimating a model with n minus n minus ten percent, okay, or ninety percent of my data, okay, which is different from estimating with ninety nine percent of my data. Okay, so I'm kind of getting a slightly different estimate. So why shouldn't I use? 
why, sh why shouldn't I use lead one and cross validation, which seems to be better? Pardon? Overfitting. Overfitting? Um, uh, overfitting. We're not overfitting the model. We're doing the right thing with the model. It's independent. So the overfitting is not too much of a problem. It's the underfitting, which is the bias when we actually sort of have when we have bigger blocks. Okay. But what's going on over here? When I average, because what I'm going to do. What am I? What am I going to do here? I am going to actually. I am going to end up with. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to do this. Okay. I'm going to take it. I'm going to leave that guy out, and I'm going to fit on all of this. Okay. And then I'm going to actually predict this guy, and I'm going to get an error. Okay. And then I'm going to get. Then I'm going to do the same thing for the second guy, and I'm going to get error number two fit on the other on all the all the data, the 99% of the data, the n minus n minus one observations, and so forth. And then I'm going to average that. I'm going to compute the average. And then I'm going to do this for each of this is model one and this is model two. Why is that not necessarily as good as actually doing this? I'm going to take a block and compute this. Because it was correlated. They're correlated. Because all the same training data is being used over and over and over again. So these are correlated. If you don't believe me, uh, in the in the GitHub repository, there's a there's a thing called Carvar. Okay. There's a file called carvar.r, okay, just as a simple multivariate random normal. Just look at it and actually see, just convince yourself that this is true, that if they're positively correlated, and they are positively correlated here, that you're actually, that these guys will, will actually have a higher variability if we use lead one cross validation under many circumstances, okay? Not all circumstances, that's the beauty of this thing. You can't say anything for certain, okay? So it all depends on your situation. But this is why we tend to use Capable cross validation, 10 or 5 or 6 or whatever number you buy evenly in, is because it tends to actually reduce the uh, variance of our test uh, error. Okay? It has a bias though because we're actually not estimating the model properly because we've actually got less observations. That's not really biased, that's just fewer observations. But it is biased because we're actually, because of the square root of the end that we're not increasing the variance of I in our. In our um, in our uh, regression case or something like that. So there's, there's, there, there, once again, this is actually an, an illustration of the bias variance trade off. And it's kind of somewhat simple. Does it matter? Maybe, maybe not. But, it, but it's kind of interesting to think about. Okay? Can you bring the Like, if you're doing the kind of. We mentioned K here to some extent. We just, because this is a totally generic. No, I mean, like, instead of doing 10%, do 5%, oh, or 2%. Sorry, or... sorry. This is why I kept away from the K. Yeah. This is the K nearest neighbors, and I've got K poles. Sorry, I've got that. That's a little bit okay. Can we manipulate this? Is that? Yeah, yeah we, we can, this is what I'm saying. We can basically make this N, in which case, then it's just leave one out, okay? And it's all we can use, or, or we can use K is equal to 2. Okay, we just split it in half, and that's okay. So as long as we don't, as long as we have some number, we can we can manipulate, and we can we can just, we can use cross validation to determine the best value of cross, capable cross validation. I was going to say, let's take out another validation set and then validate on that. Validate A on another set. I mean, you're kind of running out of data. <laughs> yeah, and that, that is so. This, this works reasonably well. Again, it, it, it's giving us the independence of actually chasing our own our own fit. Again, the King Years neighbors is a good example there. I'm literally using me as, as as my own predictor. So this is good. But we're actually we're solving that problem with the external test set that wasn't used in the training. Exactly how well we did. Is it does it matter whether you use a lead one out or k fold? In the case five or ten, it's probably not a huge amount. There is this interesting issue of there is a bias variance trade-off. And the variance is because the darn things are positively correlated. Okay, because the same observations are being used in the training set, and that's kind of a, a somewhat subtle thing. Not really, <laughs> but it's most people don't really think about it, and it's like, okay, that wasn't so good. Okay, uh, okay, so um, blah, blah, blah. okay, so one of the things actually, um, one of the things is you end up with all these tests there. So what people do. Is they just compute the total here and the total here, the average is the same thing. 
same number of observations. By the way, I, I asked that, I asked a question, do you fit all models on the same test sets? Okay, the answer is yeah. <laughs> Just keep them on the same test set to reduce the variability of, of actually sort of saying, well, because you could actually go through, block them in some way, fit, fit one model, then go through and block them again randomly, and, and fit another model. You might as well fit all the models at the same time. Especially in the case of King Nearest Neighbors, where you actually, okay, you can actually uh, really exploit some computational efficiency there. So you want to keep everything as constant as possible. So fit all the models on the same on the same training set, then predict on the test set. When you average, like, when you average the model, you'll see which one is better. You should. What have you got here? You've got you've got you've got a bunch. You've got n observations here for your for your error. Another. You can look at these. You can plot them against each other and see which ones are doing better. You can look at the histogram to think, wow, that's a weird outlier. What, what happened there? You also have blocking effects, which is this comes from this, this test set, this comes from this test set, this comes from this test set, which they're all weird. That test set is weird. Sometimes you will end up with an absolutely ridiculous test set where you didn't do it. You were smart enough not to actually just take the first one from Daniel. But when you randomly sample one of you, again, with one in 20, one in 20 chance, Somebody is going to end up with a test set that is all jangly and, and nothing to do with the actual data for the training, and you're in trouble. But you will pick that up if you actually start looking at the errors. You can do you can do data analysis. Most people just need to throw it away, and that's un un unnecessary. Yeah. So should should you do that when you're creating your accounts? Make sure that they're all you should if you're homogenous. You, you you should you should sample intelligently. Okay, you, we, you should enforce that the sampling scheme is correct, but the sampling scheme will go wrong. <clears throat> Remember what we're talking about with the uh, PV, P, P, 0.05, when the no is true, somebody's going to get that ridiculously odd sample that actually puts them in the wrong place, and you can't beat that, I mean, okay? But, but, but you, you definitely want to check to say, hang on a second, there's something funny going on here, they do not seem to have been you, if, if, Again, you have to know the answer, you have to know the answer, but if you're if you've got a test set, if you've got a test set that looks like this, and this is x1, okay, and you're and you, and you look at some statistic, and you're and so this, okay, and this is a, this this is all your test sets except for this one. And it's like these are these are not. So you can start looking at diagnostics of these things. You're probably not really going to care because most times the sampling will work. But if you go, hang on a second, that looks a bit weird. Let me see if if these guys are. You know, if we actually plot these, you know, and you look at them against the actual fitted values, so, so you, look, you look at the residual plot and you sort of see something that looks like this, okay? So everyone's down here, okay? That's this guy over here. So now you see okay, all the residuals for this one block, this one test set were high. Well, well, let me go back and take a look at that. That happens to correspond to all the x's were wrong. Or it could be that it's the joint distribution of this x against that x, but it's in a weird part of the space. Okay. Everyone happy? Yep. Yeah. He comes back, he's got lots of questions. <laughs> so, so I, I don't do this, but I know that like the controlled experiments you want to do, or treatment in control groups before you're going in, so be identical for all faculty. Do should we do this? You should sample the same way. You mean, again, I'm going to, yes, you should try to sample the same, the same scheme, the same scheme that you actually use. And, and if, let's say we, I, I break it into 10 chunks, yeah. and I just explore them, and one chunk looks very different from the other, should I re randomize my data and create 10 new chunks and not as much? Probably, I would, I mean, I don't, the answer is, the answer is, this, is, this, you, this could be overfitting again, which is that you're actually now introducing more. More um, uh, how many of them again you actually should have. So you basically now just get them all to be completely uniform. <laughs> okay. So and again, going back to this, I'm going to say this over and so uh, sorry. When we talk, when you look at the formulas for the standard error of a linear regression, or even for the mean, okay, uh, just a simple univariate mean, we have formulas for this. But it doesn't take into account all the outlier detection that you did and the, and the cleaning that you did to put this back in to make them uniform okay so kind of what you want to do in that particular case what you're saying what you're saying to me is 
I, 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 choose, I decide on, on, on a model. I, I do some larger data analysis. I choose whether to use k-nearest neighbors or support vector machines. Okay? Then I go through and I do cross validation on this. Okay, and the, when I do, before I do, in the process of doing cross validation, I shuffle my data around, I look at it, and make sure that the summary statistics are within two epsilon or two sigma or whatever, you, whatever criteria you use. And then I do the test, then I do the cross validation, then I choose the minimum one. Okay? What you need to do to actually get, if you were to bootstrap this, Okay, to actually understand what the sampling there, the, the test, the sampling distribution of your predictor is, you have to repeat the entire process, not the bit at the end. Okay, you have to actually go through the entire process, which means smoothing out your cross validation. That will, that, will, that will reflect the actual inherent variability in your models for that fitting technique. Okay, that's what we tend to miss. We tend to say, okay, I've done all this, I've got my cross validation, now I'm just going to use the formula. Model. I suppose my fingers, neighbors, or my um, or my or my standard that formula for for regression, but there was a whole lot of variability that would happen if you had a different data set, and you don't capture that, and that's what you actually have to essentially uh, resample. Okay, that's that's the variability you're getting at, which is what if I got a different set, a data set, and I did exactly the same process, not just a small part of it. Okay, so in th you know. If, if you were to do the following, for example, uh, okay, so yes, so, but so you, it's all well, it's all well and good to actually um, to uh, even out the, the uh, test sets, but, but you have to be careful if you're not just introducing some sort of bias into this whole game. Okay. Yep. So you get all of your data from the So you get. You get you do all of the functions, and then you get the losses for all the response, and then you get the average. Right? So you don't. So my personal way, you're not really dividing your training by this. So no, we're talking about most people don't. Most people just actually take their entire their entire training data, break it up into, into for cross validation purposes, into um, into these. Temporary subsets of training and, and, and tests. That's the way most people do it because they don't have the luxury of having more data. And then the second question is already that you were talking about KNN. So you don't know which K you are doing to go for. So you so you do this whole cross validation for each case separately. Uh, yeah. That's what you do. So you, well, I, you, 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 for K-nearest neighbors, you don't because it's a really funny thing about K-nearest neighbors. Is when I go back on the same, when I have the same training data and the same test data, so we can fit all our models. So if you had a cubic, a quadratic, and a linear model, you might as well fit them all on the same test, on the on the same training set, and then predict them on the same test set, and then move on to the next thing rather than revisit uh, on the same test set. Okay, <coughs> we'll take that variation out that we're good. So we're just going to fix the, the the test set, fix the training set. In all the models, do all the predictions and add in uh, our error for all the models at the same time. Okay? Now, in the case of K nearest neighbors, it's, the bizarre thing is that if you are my K, if K is one and you are my K nearest neighbors, okay, my K nearest neighbor, it's funny, when K is two, you're still my, K, my first nearest neighbor. So there's really no point in recomputing this. So I might want to do them all in one go because I can actually just order the distances with that K. You can do it, you just, I mean, um, Predict all the one go. So you can take it, you can make this very fast for K nearest neighbors. For regression, leave one out. Uh, leave one out is, it, is especially attractive because there's a formula for it, an actual closed forms, uh, a closed form uh, of actually computing what would happen if you left it out. Which um, so it's kind of nice. I, would I give up the Would I give up the variance? Yep, because it's super fast. Okay, and you actually have that statistic lying around when you actually fit them on, so you can do that very quickly. Okay. One question, why are you averaging the errors as you cycle through the test set? Why don't you make all the test sets together I am. and do one model error? I am. I, I, what I was actually doing was I just, for this observation, I got the error for this model, then the error for that model, then I moved on. Then I went on to the second, I went on to the second 
observation in my test set, and I, did, I predicted it. So I, I predicted all of these in block, and then I went moved on to the next test, and then moved on to the next test. So I have, I'm going to have n of these sitting around, no matter what. However, I did k-fold or leave one out. I have n errors uh, for each model, and now I can actually go and take a look at them all. I can, have, I can, I can aggregate them for each model. For okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing. I'm not, yeah. So, but then at the end, you're averaging all the errors. Why not? Uh, I'm averaging this one model and have one, one error. I'm averaging down the model. This is for k is this is for k is equal to one. This is for k is e this is for k nearest neighbors now, okay? Not k fold. Okay. For the mo one, one model is k is equal. This is actually k is equal to one, and the distance is equal to Euclidean. This one here is k is equal to one, and the distance is equal to Canberra. Okay? So these are different combinations. And what I do, I got all the errors, and I just okay, tell me the error for you, tell me the error for you overall. Because I'm not interested in any one. Ideally, these are all nicely distributed, there's no outliers, these are all looking good. So that was okay, and I just get the, I get the overall error. And they, they all look approximately the same, but one wins, okay, one dominates, and one, thank you very much. You're the winner, okay, or hey, you know, and then I could do something like this. I, 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 we often end up with is this. What we often end up with is this sort of thing, where, you know, and this is for, for this, we have three dimensional plot. This is for the different distances, okay? But, but starting, this is for k, and we see something like this where you go down like this, okay? And then, okay, as k gets bigger, okay, it, it, it starts, um, and the error goes back up here. Where do I choose? This is technically the smallest one. You know what? I'm going with this one. There's not an appreciable difference in the make my computation side. This is an ugly, uh, this is an ugly classifier, by the way. Because there is no simple parametric form They're like regression where I just stick. But I you know, where I, if we have something that looks like beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x two. Okay, well, I just hold the three betas around. You give me x one and x two, I give you back y. Okay, and if it's logistic regression, I compute the odds ratios and figure out the figure out the threshold thing. But I only have to do these little ones. The only thing I need are three coefficients the whole round. What do I need to hold around to actually predict a new observation in ten years next? K. Hmm? K. <laughs> I do need to know K. I need to know the distance. And there's one other really important thing I need to know. Gigabytes of observation. The bigger the data set, the worse I get. So I have to hold those around and I've got to write these. This is very computationally intensive. So it's actually from a, from that point of view, I, we don't like it because it's actually it's not necessary. Even if it, even if it actually does very well, it doesn't um, it doesn't perform well when we actually try to run it in real time. Okay. Um, so but anyway, so that's cross validation, bootstrapping. They're not the same thing. They're not the same. <laughs> Okay, they're similar, I and mean, they can be used for uh, close purposes and all sorts of stuff. Um, anyway, just uh, linear discriminant analysis. Anyone know what this is? Who's studied linear discriminant analysis? One? That's it? Good. <laughs> okay, excellent. So this is actually a, a simple thing. If you have linear, so nobody mentioned it over here, linear discriminant analysis is what we grew up with. Okay, it comes out of Bayes' theorem. You can see that map. Okay, uh, and basically, um, it ends up being very, very nice, but it is, and what's based there is it, it's a, it, you can, um, it's basically sort of trying to say probability of y given x, and then you just turn around to be the probability of x given y times the probability of y, or maybe <coughs> divided by something. Then you take ratios of these things. This is the key thing, is what we're actually, what this, where this kind of basically comes from is you say which one is more probable. You just take the ratio of the likelihoods. So in a very simple case, I keep losing this uh, in a very simple case, what we end up with again, this is just an, uh, uh, just some nice concepts in this. I think so basically in a very, very simple world, okay, here's this, okay, here's this, okay. So uh, this is okay, this is mu one and this is mu two, two means. These are normals, these are normals with mean, whatever, whichever it is. And in this particular case, we end up with the same variance, okay? God told me that these have the same variance, okay? Life is good, okay? So which, okay, you get an observation. Which, which one do you need to pick from? 
the one who's mean you're closer to. The one who's mean you were closer to, or equivalently in this very, very specialized case, the, the, the one that has the highest density at that value. Okay? Okay, so what do I actually assume here? So it turns out that it is whichever whichever mean you're closest to. If 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 pi one is equal to pi two. Remember the pi's? These were the proportions in the population. But this we don't use this rule. If this one actually we have the same distribution of the values of x. Okay, this is the x we're measuring. This is the we're, we're predicting based on this x. But if this one is way more likely to occur, so if this has 90% of the population and this has 10% of the population, I need to actually build that in. I need to adjust this. There's a prior involved here. This is the P of Y coming in here. This is P of X given Y. That's this guy here. So we compare these. So then what we do is we put this up. This is P of Y is equal to 1, P of Y equals to 0 which is the two binary cases we're interested in. I put the ratio of these in, and now I have to, now I have to adjust based on how, how prevalent they are. But in a very simple case where these are equal, life is great, and I, and I pop these guys back together. Okay, so basically it's on this side, and this density is higher. If it's, on, if it's here, this is exactly the spot where they're equal. That's equal. Okay. This is linear discriminant analysis, because basically what are we doing? We're basically, we're basically computing the distance between this along this line, okay? The formula for it. There's another formula for, for it somewhere. I forget. I can't remember that. But basically, it's, it's basically, we take the distance from u1 plus u2 over 2, the average of the mean. Okay? Where do we get quadratic data? Uh, where do we get quadratic discriminant analysis? This, is, this works out very nicely, okay? It's a very general concept. Where do we get quadratic from? What would we change over here? Two assumptions over here, but so do we got a nice state here where I basically said these are normal. And this works, by the way, for multivariate normals. Multivariate normals where we actually basically have x1 and x2. So we didn't really mention what's linear discriminant analysis. It turns out that it's actually the same, it's just a regression. Okay. Under some very specific circumstances. <laughs> okay. But it comes out of, uh, out of Bayes theorems, which is really nice. Okay. But basically, you know, we have multivariate normal that looks like this, so they're correlated. Okay, or we have another one over here where they're, they're not correlated. The x's are not correlated, but we assume that they're associated or correlated with the x's and y's, or with the y, should I say. So we might have another one that's sort of easy. So we have here, here's one group, here is another group. Okay, this so there's our linear discriminator that goes through here. Well, what happens if they look like this? And you actually saw an example of that one of them that way. Okay, what happens if you actually have this? So these have different correlation structures, don't they? They also have different variants. This is more variable. So now we actually have to take into account that this is more variable. So if that if we look like this, we don't want to just compare the relations. Okay? It's kind of built in here. We want to bring, bring in the pies. And we want to bring in, we want to also bring in the correlation structure. And what we're going to end up with is uh, a, 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 a boundary, the phase boundaries that actually allow us to discriminate. Will actually be curved, okay? And if you do the math, you do exactly the same thing with Bayes' theory. But what happens is these multivariate normals that we're dealing with now no longer have the same variance, so we actually don't drop the curve. Okay, the math just simplifies for the very simple case. Okay, so that's that's quadratic discriminant. It is the same thing if you are what? It's the same thing as logistic regression if. Hmm? Oh, you're going to say something? I can see you. <laughs> Go on, yell it out. If it's good. If what's good. Um, so again, we're always we're, we're classifying here. We're, the, the, these two things. This is disease, non-disease. There's always we're trying to predict this. We're trying to say, give me an X one, give me an X two, and if you're here, where, what, where do I put you? Okay. And so these are three-dimensional uh, uh, distributions. Okay, and we're basically saying which one you which one are you closest to? So we're basically so we're, we're happy and playing playing this game. Uh, okay, so it's going to be categorical, but we're, we're saying you can draw a line here. You can draw this guy in between. You can draw this. We can do ten nearest neighbors and actually start drawing boundaries that looks much more flexible depending on what it is. We're, we're always trying to discriminate these guys. 
the, the logistic regression will work when okay, simple logistic regression will work if uh, and be the same as our linear discriminant analysis if and only if these guys are normal. They have to be multivariate normal with the same variances. But there's an equivalence there. Okay, so these things are all very much related. <sighs> I got it. Okay, so this is this is fine. There's a whole, a whole bunch of stuff here. There's all sorts of entertaining things going on um, with what we've never, the other component in this formula that we haven't mentioned, which is bringing in the priors, pi one and pi two, bringing in the variance covariance, but there's also the cost of misclassification, which is absolutely vital, which is to do with the loss function. Okay, which goes back to the very beginning of saying, you don't frame the question like, I don't, I don't want to minimize my error, my misclassification error, I want to minimize the cost of being wrong. So if I basically sort of say, well, there's a 1% chance of this happening, that I'm wrong on this, but if it does occur, it's going to cost me a trillion dollars. I have to build that in, because it's not the same thing as being wrong, it costs me a dollar. To check that I was wrong, that I was wrong on that. So we so we want to build in these costs. We can do that in very in various models. We can do it other times. We actually have to write down different loss functions. Um, there's um, we'll we'll talk about this. Um, and do, okay, we'll um, we can I say we can go back uh, next week. We can. I was planning on doing a lot more about regression and penalized regression and regularization and stuff like that. Um, we can also talk more about classification and regression trees. Um, things will go faster because I just wanted to cover some of these um, concepts. Do people know what classification tree is? How many people know? Somebody wrote down. Somebody said classification trees. Awesome. So this this leads to. I'm going to do this very quickly and hopefully it actually makes sense. If not, please let me know. Uh, it's, there's some very nice ideas here. And we'll do them in terms of trees. Trees don't tend to work out too well. But they're not bad. They're like cleaner stain, but they're not bad. Yeah. But basically, what, what are we going to do here? The world's simplest thing is if I have, okay, we will go back. Here's x, 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 x. Okay, and then we have a zero, a zero, a zero. So these are the two classes we're trying to actually deal with. Here's another zero, here's another zero. And then if I have another x, okay, so this is x1 and this is my data. And if I have another one that looks something like the following, which is here's a zero, here's a zero. This goes from zero to one. This is minus 20 to 200, so they're on totally different scales. One of the things I'm not showing you here is how the x's are, are jointly distributed. I could, but I'm not going to bother, okay? Yet we're not going to use it, okay? Which one would you use to predict? Uh, I'll make sure we have here. Okay, we have this. Which one would you predict? Which one would you use to classify y? Y of x. Okay. Clearly, this guy again. We talked about this. Is bingo. That just is a perfect separator. And I'm out of here. Okay. Now this involves my test set and so forth. Okay. Cross validation. But this, if you end up with this one, these are perfectly separable. Okay. You can actually. There's no overlap. Which would you use if I move this point over here? Let's say. Now, which would you use? Both? No, not allowed. <laughs> That's hard. It's super hard to use both. Okay? There's an infinite number of splits I could make. I could split here. Okay, that's a stupid. Okay, because there's nothing there. Okay, I start here. Do I split here? That's a perfect split. This guy's perfect, yes? If I predict, okay, I'll use sort of the nearest neighbor to approach or whoever's in my pocket, I do a majority of votes. So if I split here, I do really what? One out of one. This is 100%, but not very good. Over here, I get 50 50, because that's not a very good split. If I split here, for example, I get 100%, but this is now four out of four, which is better. Uh, and I end up with, oh, this is not bad, actually. This is a one, two, three, four, five. Five, I get, I get, I get uh, five out of six being correct, because I'm going to do a majority vote here. Now let's see, if, okay, what if I split here? That gives me a similar thing, but it's not quite as good. But I, so if I can measure what goodness means, or if I can say, this is, this is the measure of impurity, this is the measure of impurity. Together they have this impurity. And if I do the same thing up here, if I do it for this split, and I measure which one is which is more pure, or which one has better predictive power. Then I will choose for this for this one variable. I will find the best split. Yes. 
Okay, it's a, it's a complicated, exhaustive computational problem, but no, it turns out to be pretty fast. Okay, so we'll find the one that gives me the best split. This seems to be a good split. Perfect, five out of six. What about up here? I can do the same thing. Okay, I will go through all possible splits and I will choose the best one. Yeah? Everyone with me? Anyone with me? Good. So this is fine. So basically, I'm going to say this is my best split. So what do I do? I take my n observations and I go down here. And I say, you have x2 less than this value, so you get a subset down here. And everyone else goes over here. These ones are perfectly predictive. Okay? So I'm done. Happy? This is a classification stump. Okay? I've just got one, one variable for a very small tree that's been chopped. Okay? Because you can so see there's a tree here. Okay, but it's a stunt because only, it's only one thing. We started with all of the n observations here. We went down and did this. Everyone with me? It's fine. So now the, 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 we do this recursively. This is perfect. We just stop. These guys are perfectly done. This was very unusual. But now what we do is we look at these guys and we split them. How do we do it? We look at all of the variables once again. Okay, for this subset, it's a different subset now. So we, the, the computations are going to give different results. So we split again. We find the best one. Okay, and we split, we keep going, keep going, keep going. And eventually we end up with these leaf nodes, which are perfect, just like this one. They're all perfect. Each of them has one observation, one out of one, which is, which is what? Overfitting, which means we have, in terms of well, too much variance, okay? Because when I get a different data set, these splits, this guy just turns, he's over here now, and I'll get a different split. So this is going to be a very unstable um, thing. It's to say that says that the structure of the tree will be unstable. It doesn't actually mean that the results will be unstable. The actual predictions may be actually exactly the same. But as we get a different data set, the form of the, of the tree may be different. It also may, may mean that the actual results are different. That they're, they're somewhat unstable. This is a very nice idea because Actually, if we wanted to do the joint distribution, like we were saying, use both or use all p variables, that is an NP hard problem. Okay, it is computationally infeasible, so we can't do this. This is incredibly greedy. We take the biggest one as we go. We take the biggest split and say, that's it, we're not looking back. We may actually pick the wrong path. This is an optimization problem. We're trying to minimize the total error, and we're just going, we can't do it globally, we have to do it locally and follow and chase our tail and just pray that at the end we actually have. The, the, the right uh, optimum. Okay, how are we going to fix this? Random. Randomness. We love randomness. We hate randomness. Don't we hate randomness? It's, 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 we're always going to get rid of the randomness. And yet, here we're going to actually do we're going to inject randomness in here. Okay, we're going to inject randomness in two ways. And they're going to be related to? Yes, but so they're going to be related to? <laughs> The bias and the variance, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because everything is related to the bias variance. It's actually a very useful way to think about things, to actually say, how much bias do I care about? How much variance will, will I prepare to trade off? Because in this test, it, 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 what we normally see is this is the test mean squared error or misclassification rate. You're basically saying this is, this is the complexity of the model. And basically what's happening is it starts off, and we get down to here, and now we're getting good, and then it starts going back up again. So what we generally see this is in the test MFC. In the, in the training MFC, we see this. It's constantly going down. The more we overfit, the better it looks. Okay, but we're in the, nobody's interested in this. We're only, only interested in the, in the sort of externally validated. But this is basically saying, okay, the bias, the bias is going down to some extent. Now we're actually, we're, we, now we're actually able to capture the features of the model. Now the variance is going back up again because we're overfitting the model to the individual observations. Okay? So how do we do this? So this goes back to our bootstrap. That's why I introduced the bootstrap earlier here. What we're actually going to do is these trees I said are unstable. How do we get rid of how do we remove unstableness or high variability? Averaging. So what we're going to do is well we don't have anything to average. What we do, we have that magic trick is that we just make new data. You just pretend you have new data. Seems a bit tricky. As long as you get the sampling scheme right, your life is good. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to build lots of trees. We start off with our. Uh, we start off. We start off with x one, 
up to xp for 1 to n. 1 up to n, right, is good. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new data set, x star 1 up to p from 1 to n by sampling with replacement. Yeah, fit the model, off we go. Now what am I going to do? Okay, so I fit a tree here. So what, what's my classifier going to be? Okay. Majority vote. Majority vote across here. So it's going to be each one is going to do a majority vote in its leaf. Okay, so this one's going to say, I think you're a plus. This over here, when you get down to here, it thinks it's a zero, something like that. But when I run a new test set, a new test observation, I will get one of these and I'll get, okay, so it's a plus. I, over here, I get a zero, I get a zero. Over here, I get a plus, I get another plus, and I take the majority vote. Should I do that? How can I make it better? <laughs> That's the next this is, this is what's called bagging. Okay, bootstrap aggregation. I'm aggregating here across bootstrap samples. I'm letting them vote for that aggregate. I can improve this by actually weighting them based on their confidence, so the probabilities associated. If this is, this is a plus, but it's four out of five, and this is a zero, but it's actually one, it's, 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 um, but when I think about now, it's two out of three. Well, okay, which one is better? But it's now it's two out of, it's sort of, sort of six out of 20. Okay, now that wasn't a win. So we can actually put probability p hats on top of these things. That's, a, that's an improvement. But basically, we can take the majority vote. Now, how do we make this even better? What's the problem with this? If you try to sequentially grow the trees. That's another matter, okay. We're not talking about that. That's a whole different ballgame. That, 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 that's, Okay, this one we can fix. We can fix this, okay, based on what? What's the problem? What did we say? What was the problem we had earlier with the um, with the lead one and cross validation? And, and are these parasitically correlated? Why? Why on earth are these parasitically correlated? Because it's greedy? Because the biggest, the, the best split, but it'll be on a different data set. Why? Go on. Why? So does that, are people, do people see this? Which is? The bootstrap is really, it's the same, it's the same data. Like when you're bootstrapping, you're trying to create new data, so it's the... No, it's not that, that, so that, that you could think about that, but in fact, we're actually getting enough variability in the, in the test sets to be our, in, in, in the bootstrap samples, I would say 60, you know, 37% of people drop out. So there'll be enough mixing here. And if we do it often enough, we'll get enough mixing. That'll be good. But the trouble is they are positively correlated. And the reason they're positively correlated is because if we happen to have a, um, a, a pretty good predictor, it will always be the dominant force. Okay, so 1x is actually pretty good at nailing it down. We'll always pick it. In which case, it's always going to be, going to be very similar. Even though they have different data, it's still going to be approximately the same tree, okay? Uh, approximately. So here's this ridiculous trick. We have p observations. So what we were doing here is at any point in the split, we look through this and we find the best splits. So we look at all p variables. We look at all the data and we find we go through for each for each uh, predictor, we go find the best split based on some criterion that we need, gene entropy, whatever it is. Okay, so we look at these. Now here's the trick, which just seems insane. Okay, at each split we have p of these, and we throw away a whole lot. We don't look at certain predictors. What sort of modeling system is this? Is they have all these predictors, and they throw them away, <laughs> and then and actually only use a subset of them intentionally. We're actually being biased. Okay, we're actually sort of saying, I know I cannot actually capture the features here. If they didn't behaves on all of these. So basically we're going to actually introduce bias, okay, but we're going to reduce variance. Okay, this is the whole game again. We're reducing variance because, okay, and we're reducing the variance. How are we reducing the variance? Because of the correlation. This correlation actually comes back into play far too often, okay, because if they're positively correlated, then it actually drives up the variance. You know, there's two ways to drive to change variance. 
Okay, one of them is actually increase the sample size. Never have to throw them back out. Okay, <laughs> okay, but uh, that's the ideal thing. But in this case, what we actually do is we we take something like the following as a, as a general rule of thumb. We take n predictors equals approximately the square root of p. So if you if you have a hundred predictors, you take you'll use ten of those. Okay, so the key thing here is it's each time whenever you're building any tree, you have, you have thousands of bootstrap trees, you're making low, many, many, many splits. Each time you create a different square root of p. It's kind of nuts, okay? But it's actually embracing randomness that actually gets us the answer that we want. The same thing when you're doing optimization, you're embracing randomness to, to find better, to get out of the and, uh, and uh, local networks the same, things like that. This is great. So this is two steps. Bagging, which has got nothing to do with this, okay? Bagging is generating a bunch of bootstrap samples and fitting your model. So here we're doing a classification tree, but it could be anything. It could be a lot of regression models, it doesn't matter. The other, but then the next step is make this a random forest, okay? So it's, we have this thing called a random forest, is clearly there's a bunch of trees. Hence it's a forest, it's random because we're actually ra randomly selecting variables at each point in the split, which is the only extra trick from bagging, so from bagging to um, from bagging to random forest is literally this trick of throwing away predictors, which is the stupidest thing in the world. <laughs> okay, uh, but it, 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 it actually works. It's an amazingly effective thing considering it's such a goofy idea. Uh, okay, but this this is random forest. So what we didn't actually end up talking about, which uh, which is another trick, which I was mentioning which is another trick. So this is what's called an ensemble. These guys vote. And there's nothing special about this. You can bootstrap anything, you can bag anything. You don't even have to bootstrap. You can have two models, model one, model two, and this is some bizarre model, and this is some, another bizarre model. They can vote and you can have them talk about this. You might as well wait them. But there's another approach, which will take me two minutes, which is the, which is the following. This is called boosting. Again, this is kind of a wacky notion, and you can overfit if you do this. This one's hard to overfit, okay, with the, across bootstrap samples. There you're just increasing the, the stability of your estimate. This one you can overfit on. But the idea here is simply this, okay, which is kind of weird, and it does connect to what I was talking about very, very early on. You've got a model that looks like this. You've got, you've got data that looks like this, and you fit a linear model, okay? You didn't get this guy over here. You missed these guys over here. These were hard. Okay, they didn't quite fit. You chose this model. Okay, so what do we do? Step two is we fit another model. So you actually have model one. Okay, this is a regression model. It can be a classification model. You have a classifier. What you now do is you look at these and you go, okay, it might be simpler. Let me do it this way. We do this. We do the following. Okay, so you have these. Uh, you have uh, plus and plus and minus and minus and minus and plus and plus. Okay, and we have minuses over here. Okay, so here's here's a model. We're going to do a very simple model here. Okay, there. That's uh, what we're going to do here. We will do. Uh, we will draw this. Okay, that's the best stuff I can do. Okay, okay. Basically, these are all perfect. These are. This one is not. And I'm grossly oversimplifying this to, to, to them. Okay, but this this is the best linear split. This is what this is a sum. This is this is better than guessing. Yes. Okay, that's all I need. I need this is what the boosting turns what's called a weak classifier, which is just doing slightly better than plus and coin, into a strong learner. Okay, so from weak to strong, I do the following. Okay, I do this. I'm done. And now we'll, we could go through and overfit this and. Okay, we start doing this. This is overfitting. But here's what I do next step, which is a totally different concept. It is I increase the weight of this, the cost of misclassification of this guy. Okay? And then I fit another model to all of the data again, which means I'm probably going to actually miss the details. So I'm going to give up on what I did well, but actually go after the hard. In the regression case, I'm going to actually look at these big residuals. And I'm going to say, 
I'm going to increase your weight and increase your weight. You, I'm going to decrease your weight because I got you right. This model was really good. There's structure left in the, in the data that I didn't get. I'm going to chase you. So when we're doing these squares, we can do weights of these squares. So that's fine. So we increase the weights to chase after the guy who did the bad one. And we get model two. And then we, go, we look at them and say, which did you not get right? Six, uh, in model two, we go, okay, increase your weights, decrease, relatively speaking, the weights on the other guy who we did well on. And you keep chasing this. And eventually you stop. This is where you have to know when to stop. How do you know? Cross up. God, it's a good tip for them. <laughs> okay, the cross validate, but that's fine. But basically, we increase the weight here. And then the trick to this is how do we put these back together? I've got one model, two model, three. What should I do? Why wait? You said wait. Why wait? To decrease the variance. Well, to decrease the variance. And also, basically, this one was good. This is our first go. This one. Is, is actually distorted, chasing the wrong value. So it's actually probably going to be very badly on the ones we did well on over here. So we can actually weight by how well it does on overall, okay? And there is a mechanism by which we can actually do this. And if we look at this, we look at one, if you get one over the error rate, um, yeah, one over the error rate, uh, over the error rate here, we can actually look at this. As long as these stupid models do better than 50%, Accuracy, this thing will actually start doing better. Okay, progressively getting better. Okay. Then what we do is we use some, some, some formula for this case in the long this guy. Okay, to increase the weights, then we decrease the weights of these. We increase the weights on the residuals and we decrease the weights on each of the models. And this is the thing called boost, which is actually quite a clever idea, but totally and utterly different from that. Okay, and bootstrapping. So they're, they're kind of neat ideas. Okay, and you can go around and you can play with these and, and do that. You can always overfit. If there's one message today, it is. It is. Bias bearing straight off. Because it comes up absolutely everywhere. And um, if you, um, I would love to know uh, what you would like to talk about next week. We can say this. We can talk about regularization and that's so and lots of technology, different things. If that's, interest, if that's of interest, we can, uh, we can go into more. more and examples and so forth, uh, as, as you so desire, let me know, probably, um, but, uh, or, or not at all, I take the day off. <laughs> always, always a comfort. Uh, so, um, as I said, we, uh, I would be laboring some of the basic points here because, if you, if, in my mind, if you actually get some of the univariate problems, but most people don't think about the covariance being positive, which actually changes the variance because that was six years ago when you took your first. Stack class or whatever, or maybe even wanting to address in there. Um, so uh, next time we can actually hopefully get onto more uh, more methods related to stuff. But again, I'll all that. Method. Thank you. Talk to you soon. If you if you have any feedback, let me know. Where's the red thing? Going? <laughs> Thank you.